Folks, we'll call this uh, meeting of the Commerce and Consumer Protection Committee to order. Um, my name is Joe Atkins, and I'm here to apologize. I'm the guy I'm actually wearing shorts, and I never thought I'd wear shorts to a uh, to a hearing, but I couldn't get my shoes on this morning. I had uh, I tore my Achilles about a month and a half ago. Today was going to be my big day, putting a dress shoe back on, and I couldn't without a shoehorn and a wedge of some sort. I don't think I could have got it on, and by later this afternoon, I probably would have had to cut it off. So my apologies for wearing shorts and a t-shirt. My also birthday wishes, post-birthday, to our friend and former chair, Representative David, who turned a speed limit. What, you said you're 70, not was it? Not the interstate. Oh, not the interstate. <laughs> <laughs> and to the newest member of the Commerce Committee, Representative Anderson's uh, son is joining us today. Would he like to introduce himself and sing a song or anything? He's, he's like, what are they doing, talking about me? <laughs> Thank you very much to um, folks who uh, don't know this. We're working without per diem today. Uh, and so all of the folks that showed up here showed up literally just for pizza. I offered to buy lunch uh, and wondered if anybody would come. That's the sort of commitment that this uh, group has, and I appreciate it very much. Uh, that's also my way of promising we will be done by mealtime. Um, and with, the, with that, the first item that we have this morning uh, is business climate issues, Minnesota and Wisconsin. Uh, it says on the title, and if Professor Shaver from the Carlson School at the University of Minnesota would join us at the at the uh, desk, we've um, uh, our friend uh, Governor Walker was also uh, uh, invited to join us from Wisconsin. He's made a number of pointed comments uh, towards uh, towards Minnesota in the last few months, and rather than uh, than take his uh, 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 word for it or take Governor Dayton's word for it about who's got a better business climate. Uh, I thought what we would try to do is uh, base our assessment on some objective data. Uh, and uh, Professor Shaver from the Carlson School was kind enough uh, to uh, be willing to join us this morning. By the way, is this thing really loud? It, it, uh, maybe if I talk from here. Uh, but uh, Professor, thank you for taking the time. We've also, or we could just turn it off altogether, apparently. <laughs> That's, people have wanted to do that for years. Um, but we wanted to take and look at uh, objective data from the two states and uh, see what that has to offer, uh, and then uh, take questions from members of the committee and see what uh, what the comparison looks like. You really did just turn it all the way off, didn't you? No, it's on. <laughs> I wear shorts for one time, and you turn it down. Um, can you hear us? Yeah. Can you hear me? That's really the most critical thing, as long as you can hear me. I don't know about the other members. But, uh, Professor, welcome to uh, the Commerce and Consumer Protection Committee. The floor is yours. Well, after we uh, hear from you, we'll take some questions from members of the committee, and then we've got a representative here from the Department of Employment and Economic Development as well. Thank Great. you, Professor no. Shaver. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, so just a little bit of background why I'm here is uh, Representative Adkins forwarded the, the data that I think a number of you have seen with other metrics to his constituents, and that was forwarded to me. And uh, I decided to chime in and said that you know, I, I've been now here in Minnesota for 12 years, and one of the things that has struck me since I moved here, and is actually one of the reasons why we moved here, is the business climate. In particular, the large concentration of big corporate headquarters here. It was a big thing for a dual career situation. It makes it a great place to work in a business school and things like that. The thing is, and, and I said that I'd be happy to add some of these comparisons based on some of my data. What I will say is that, you know, when I talk to my colleagues around the world with respect to what it's like to be in Minnesota or they're at, when the snow flies, if they're asking me if I'm ready to leave, it really is one of the things that makes it an exciting place to be a business school professor is the business climate. And I tell them that, you know, the extent to which we have large corporate headquarters here, and at first they don't believe me, and then if you actually begin to tell the companies, tell them about the companies, the size of it, the next question that they ask is why. And so that's been what I've been up to now for the last couple of years. This is an ongoing project. I really want to understand why we had such a predominance of corporate headquarters here in Minnesota and especially the Twin Cities. And what does that mean for continuing that? Because that has lots of benefits for our state and for this region. And so being the academic, it's, you know, we all have pet theories. And I've talked to lots of people around the state, 
business leaders, political leaders, students, the like. Everybody has a theory, but I want to back this up with data. And so one of the things when it comes to corporate headquarters, these things don't, you know, these are sort of discrete movements. You add a headquarter, you lose a headquarter. That's noticeable if you're focusing on the Fortune 500. So for that reason, my goal is, as a first step, let's really describe what it is and what it's looked like over time. So if we go back to 1955, which is about the time that Fortune starts compiling the Fortune 500 list, Minnesota has 11 Fortune 500 headquarters. Wisconsin has 11 Fortune 500 headquarters in 1955. If we forward, fast forward to 2010, and, and the data that I show you from there, one Fortune 5 headquarter has moved since that period of time. That's ATK moving its C-suite to Virginia to be closer to DC. If we take a look at, at Minnesota then in 2010, it had 20 Fortune 500 headquarters. Now, if you want to compare that to what it looks like to other states around the country, that would rank number eight. But what's impressive is if you look at the other states ahead of Minnesota, both in terms of their size, so these are going to be places like New York and Illinois and Texas, they're much bigger states in terms of population and the economy. So if you want to get some sense of headquarters activity here for the size of the population or the size of the economy, and you scale it that way, Minnesota is the most headquarter intensive state in the nation in 2010. And you know, it's not just this Fortune 500. If you look at publicly traded, or private firms, so you know, one of the distinguishing features of this region is we have a lot of very big, high profile, privately held firms. Again, so 2010, Forbes comes out with a list of about the 500 biggest private held firms in the country. And again, if you sort of rank Minnesota on that list, it ends up around that number eight position. The, the precise data are in the, in the presentation that I've handed out. As with the other if, Fortune if I 500. I interrupt for just a minute, Professor. For, for folks in your packets, you'll find uh, the full presentation that Professor Shaver is referencing. I believe it's in the back of your, uh, back of your packets in your folders. Um, and about uh, seven or eight pages in is where we, uh, there's quite a bit of, uh, um, well, I guess, throughout. There's but, lots uh, of data there. So, yeah. um, That's, we wouldn't expect anything else from a professor, but it's uh, the Fortune 500 numbers and headquarter numbers, I, begin, I believe, begin on like five, six, seven, eight. Right. And, and, sorry to interrupt. No. And once again, if, if you sort of look at the level of these big private headquarters compared to the other states that have more than Minnesota, all those other states tend to be a lot bigger. And in that ranking, Minnesota would end up sort of second or third most populous state per capita in terms of these big private headquarters. So you know, when I presented these data, and, and, and these data are from a presentation that I did at the St. Paul Chamber, is you know, we know that this is a big business community, that we have a preponderance of corporate headquarters. But when I show these to people, most people are surprised about how pronounced that is. But the one, there's one thing with respect to the discussion today with respect to this Minnesota-Wisconsin comparison that, that I wanted to highlight, though, and that's in looking at these data. As I mentioned, in 55, both states had 11 Fortune 500 headquarters. If we fast forward to 2011, where the data were, <coughs> Minnesota had 20, so a net gain of nine. Wisconsin, or Wisconsin dropped to nine. So actually, Wisconsin, and Iowa went from three to two. And the Dakotas have no Fortune 500 headquarters, and they didn't have any in 1955. So Minnesota's actually increased over this period of time, and that's a little bit of an aberration for a lot of northern states. So New York's seen a decrease, Ohio's seen a <coughs> decrease, Wisconsin's seen a decrease, Illinois's seen a decrease, those types of things. So just to, to bring those data out to bear, that, that's sort of the comparison. Uh, one other comparison that I would make, and it wasn't, and again, I wasn't, I'm not looking at this to compare Minnesota to Wisconsin. It's just a comparison that, that came naturally. I'm more concerned about how do we understand Minnesota's and the Twin Cities' prevalence of headquarters within the global economy, because th this is really where these companies compete. But having said that, in compiling the, the data, one of the other things that sort of struck me in scaling this is 
just how the economies of the two states have changed over the last 50 years. And let me give you an example. And these were just for data that I was using to scale there. So if we look in the 1960s, <coughs> Wisconsin has a bigger population than Minnesota by about 18%. So that's in 1960. In 1965, Wisconsin's economy is also bigger than Minnesota's by about 18%. If we fast forward to 2010, Wisconsin is still a larger state in terms of population. It's about 7% larger than Minnesota. Wisconsin's economy is 8% smaller than Minnesota's. So there's been this change over time. And again, I, when I contacted <coughs> Representative Atkins, it's like, you're putting together these data. Let me just add these to the list of data points that you're collecting. And hence was the invitation. So rather than running through the rest of the presentation, which I'd be happy to do, to talk to you about, I think I'll just leave my comments there. And thank you, Professor. And by the way, this is, I should have said it at the outset, the point of this uh, discussion, it's not about Wisconsin bashing. Um, we've all probably got friends and family and and uh, folks in Wisconsin, it's, uh, but there seems to be, whenever you start comparing the two states, uh, particularly on sports, but also on economically, there's this exaggeration and propaganda and all of that that, uh, that tends to occur. Uh, and I, uh, moreover, I would never bash Wisconsin since right here uh, next to me is a guy from Milwaukee who's considerably taller and younger than I am. Um, but uh, with the, just a couple quick follow-ups and then I want to... Uh, here from committee members too, but you said the Minnesota's most headquarter intensive state uh, in the nation. Uh, headquarter intensive, is that on a, by per capita or what's the measure for and headquarter so, intensive? Yeah, so, so these data here from 2011, it's both per capita and per size of the economy. You know, Fortune 500 headquarters with the one movement, I believe in 2012, Minnesota lost one headquarter, Connecticut gained two Fortune 500s. Connecticut became number one in terms of per capita. But I will say, and, and I don't think the data are in here, but then on, on terms of the size of the economy, in 2011, Minnesota is the most headquartered state by an order of magnitude. Okay. And then the other was uh, Wisconsin's number of headquarters uh, seems to have dropped precipitously over the last uh, five decades. Is that any uh, manufacturing the cause of that, or what's the, to the extent you can draw a conclusion? You know, I, I have no idea because I'm, not really interested in the Wisconsin headquarters per se, to, to tell you the truth, and it was more of just a comparison with respect to where we are. You know, what I will say about the Minnesota numbers, and, and this will be the same everywhere, Minnesota, as I show in the data from 55 to 91, there's a net gain of, of nine headquarters. It went from 11 to 20. That's a little bit deceptive, because Minnesota added 40 Fortune 500 headquarters over that period of time and lost 31. <clears throat> so these are things that churn, as we would expect that they do. And so yeah, I, I don't even want to speculate with what's in Wisconsin because I, I don't know the makeup. Okay. And uh, my only point in asking is to, to the extent that we can learn from what our neighbors are doing. Yep. Um, but uh, are there other questions for members of the committee? Okay. Um, thank you very much, Professor. We appreciate the, the presentation. We've also... Uh, uh, and by the way, we'll, we'll circulate uh, Professor Shavers, if it's all right, your contact information as well Absolutely. Um, for members of the committee. Uh, we have Kim uh, Babing from the uh, Department of Employment and Economic Development, uh, who's got uh, data for us as well. And then finally, within your packets, uh, uh, you'll find a sheet, I believe it was, I don't actually know who it was prepared by, but it's got some job growth, economic performance. Uh, taxes, comparisons, unemployment, education, and again, the Fortune 500 data that uh, uh, Professor Shaver compiled. Thank you. Welcome back. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, I'm Kim Babine. I'm Director of Government Affairs at DEED, um, and happy to share with you today some of the economic data that our labor market information and analysis and evaluation office uh, compiles on a regular basis and some indicators that we look at to see um, how our economy is doing, and um, especially compared to that of our neighbors. So we have good news on this front. Um, just a, a few key things that we like to talk about and things that, that are worth highlighting. Um, Minnesota, in addition to um, what Professor Shaver was talking about with uh, the number of our Fortune 500s and pieces like that, we have some other indicators that we look at. So 
Minnesota ranks second in the nation for the percentage of the population with a high school diploma and outperformed um, all four of our neighbors uh, in that that ranking. North Dakota ranks ninth, Iowa and South Dakota tied for 10th, and Wisconsin ranked 13th. So in that one we were second. Uh, Minnesota ranks 11th in the nation for the percentage of the population with a college degree or higher and outperformed our four neighbors. Wisconsin ranked 28th, North and South Dakota tied at 31, and Iowa's at um, 34th. Uh, looking at education is an important indicator for future long-term economic growth. Uh, one that uh, is important to look at, Minnesota had the fifth fastest growing economy uh, and we outperformed three of our four neighbors, Iowa at 16th, Wisconsin at 32nd, and South Dakota at 42nd. So fifth fastest growing economy in the nation is uh, something that we can all be proud of. Minnesota's job growth in 2012 was the 12th best among 50 states. And we, again, outperformed three of our four neighbors, Iowa at 30, South Dakota at 44, and Wisconsin was at 42nd. Uh, Minnesota has a higher per capita income than all but one of our neighboring states and saw the fourth largest percent increase in per capita income in the nation between 2011 and 2012. Only North Dakota showed a larger increase. So we know that we outperform our neighbors uh, in a lot of these categories, except North Dakota in economic growth and income. We outperform all of our neighbors in terms of education, a leading measure of sustained long-term economic opportunity and growth. Uh, so we know that, excuse me, um, that we are selling results in Minnesota. Um, we are talking every day with businesses across the country and across the world who are looking to expand and relocate here in Minnesota and, why and we're talking with businesses about why it's a great place to do business. Um, and we have a diverse economy, we have a prospering business sector, strong workforce and quality of life that puts us in a good place for long-term growth and long-term economic stability. Thank you, Ms. Babine. Mm -hmm. Are there questions for Ms. Babine? Representative Anderson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I was wondering, could you tell me, I know that we have spent some money to try and lure some businesses here. Mm -hmm. There was the business in Brooklyn Park, and uh, there's some recent reports of other businesses that have that the governor has tried to go after. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me how much have we spent on that? And what is our success ratio so far? I haven't heard anything more on the Brooklyn Park thing, so I don't know if it fell through or, or where we're at. Can you give me an update on that, please? I would be Ms. happy to, Ms. Representative, Ms. Mr. Chair, Representative Anderson. The uh, governor has said he will go anywhere and do anything to get uh, more jobs here in Minnesota. So most the Brooklyn Park project that you were talking about uh, that happened uh, this spring is still in the works. They have not yet. Um, Last update I got, they are still negotiating some of the terms of the business subsidy agreement. So the legislation that happened only enables us to do the work that we do in every case. It just gave us a higher amount. So that um, is very much still happening. It just, um, an award has not been absolutely set. They haven't negotiated all the terms of that agreement. Uh, other opportunities uh, that the governor has recently traveled on, including the sh Shutterfly uh, expansion that was just um, just announced. Uh, I don't have the total dollars for the Minnesota Investment Fund or other um, incentives that we've given um, with me, so it would depend on what do you want it from the beginning of the calendar year, but I can get that for you. Um, and our historical rate of return on that is for every one dollar of state dollars that we put in, we get a 33 dollars of leveraged private investment. So it's a 33 to one return on investment. Representative Anderson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, I think what would be, I would appreciate those results if you could get those to me. I'm also interested in knowing, are, are we using funds that we traditionally have uh, certain criteria to use I assume different grant programs mm -hmm. and how do you determine who is the award recipient are we still following the guidelines that we have set forth 
for these different grant programs that we have out there mm -hmm. to make sure that it's a fair and competitive process. Mm -hmm. Can you give me more details when you give this information to me? I'd like to know exactly from each of the different funds where they came from and then what the traditional uh, criteria that's used when we award those funds um, outside of the governor kind of going out and picking certain businesses to try and lure. If you could get that information to me too, I think that would be really helpful. Mr. Chair, if I Ms. might, um, I'm happy to give you the specifics on that. So just a little bit about the process on how that works. Um, the businesses that um, there are, we have a long pipeline of businesses that we're working with. So we have business reps in uh, strategically located in um, different parts of the state so that we are um, covering the entire state and through other programs that we work with, we are in constant contact with businesses um, looking to, and we're the main point of contact for businesses who want to expand in Minnesota, relocate in Minnesota, who might need assistance. So the ones that um, the governor visits are ones that uh, they have, uh, the governor wants to be involved to make sure that um, they come here. It's kind of the, the final final piece of the puzzle that they want to hear from the governor that uh, the governor supports um, job growth here and wants the business here but in all these programs in the Minnesota Investment Fund in the new job creation fund that starts on January 1st that you uh, created last session in our redevelopment programs everything else there are strict criteria um, of eligibility first and then um, we have accountability measures so in Minnesota Investment Fund in particular job creation fund they have to have uh, job creation criteria uh, of a floor and private investment that they have to um, invest so much for us to become involved. And I, I'll share those uh, eligibility and then uh, other criteria for performance measures that they have to meet. Happy to do that. And just by the way, to set the bar for the governor, when I was mayor of Inver Grove a long, long time ago, I, mm -hmm. I spent $64 in gas to drive from Invergrove to Chicago. Okay. And I knocked on the door at Carasota's Theaters because they were talking about putting two theaters in the Twin Cities area. They were so freaked out that I'd actually drive down. I didn't have an appointment. I just knocked on their door. And uh, they decided to look at Invergrove. They developed an Invergrove, two and a half million dollar theater that they built there. Calculation about $33,000 to one. Um, for every dollar I spent, so if the governor could, you know, step it up. You said thirty-three dollars for one. I'm just saying. Mr. Chair, I will pass that along. We have we have work to do to reach that goal. You, I know who would have thought. I brought my kids with me, though they were cute as Anderson's kids down there. So, um, and uh, Representative Loon. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'd like to thank the witness. I just had a, a couple of questions. I know you. I cited some of uh, the job growth numbers in that. Obviously, we're paying very close attention to that as we are hopefully have moved out of the recession and, and um, into recovery. Um, but can you talk a little bit about what we're seeing in 2013, since we're kind of you know more than halfway through the calendar year with that, and mm -hmm. what we're seeing in terms of job growth and where where that growth is occurring, which which industries or which sectors of our economy are seeing uh, the jobs being added? Ms. Bayman. Great. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Loon, uh, a lot of the, the statistics um, are, as we look at indicators, we look at a, a little bit of a, a longer view. All the indicators, as they're coming back month by month, uh, have been very strong. So we are seeing uh, strong reports um, in, in the indicators that we look at around job growth. Um, exactly what sectors that um, are showing growth. I didn't bring recent reports with me, um, but I can get back to you on that I, and have my labor market information team um, pull a little bit more data there. Representative Loon. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you. I, yeah, I'd appreciate seeing that. I'm just curious, like some, I mean, do you happen to know off the top of your head, like manufacturing or um, construction, some of these industries that were really hard hit, um, how, how they're doing in Minnesota? Ms. Bayman. Mr. Chair, Representative Loon, uh, I know that there are a number of industries that are showing uh, good growth and good recovery continued. 
recovery, um, manufacturing being one that is that we still have work to do in, um, and that we are addressing that 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 recovery is has been a little bit slower than others. Okay. Representative Woodard. And uh, thank oh, you. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Representative Lone. Oh, thanks. <laughs> just, I'm, I'm sorry. Back to just, um, my bad. I, I, Couple more questions, if I may, Mr. Chair. I appreciate your indulgence. Um, and then, uh, does Deed track the difference between full-time and part-time jobs that are added? Because I know that's that's one of the other factors that we've been dealing with. That uh, people may be getting back to work, but they may not be at full-time or you know as many hours as, as previous employment when times were better. Uh, does does Deed track those differences within our labor market? Ms. Bayby. Mr. Chair, Representative Loon, um, we track that. To some degree, but not. Um, it's in the surveys that we do and the data that we track. We look at um, wage records and other other pieces. I don't think we have that um, necessarily to that detail, but I, I could be wrong on that. I can check and get back to you. Okay, that would be good to know because I think it's. Um, it would be good if, if Deed would report that because obviously if a, a full-time job is lost and it's replaced with a part-time job, that still is a significant impact on our economy and, and wage earning potential for for our, our citizens. Um, one last question. I know um, obviously there's been discussion and you, you just highlighted a little bit about the governor's efforts and, and Deed's efforts to attract uh, employers to come here. There was a, a recent significant um, development with a flour milling operation with a, kind of a joint venture with a couple of Minnesota companies that is not going to be here. It's going to be in Colorado. Um, I mean, could you could you fill us in a little bit on what, what type of discussions Deed was involved in uh, to try to keep that business here as opposed to moving out of state to Colorado? Ms. Bateman. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Loon, um, you happen to know the the name of that business? Representative Loon. Well, it, it was Cargill, Cargill and uh, General Mills, I believe, joint venture and oh. some mom and pop shops. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, um, Mr. Chair, Representative Loon, um, I am not uh, necessarily. Uh, familiar with any conversations that that may have taken place um, we are we work with businesses when when we know that they uh, they come to us and they say we're looking to expand we have this offer on the table from uh, this state and what what can you do for us Minnesota so if businesses uh, make that decision without <laughs> contacting us or if we don't know that they're considering expanding uh, then there's there's nothing we can do at that point, so it's a, uh, it's in our business representatives and uh, our relationships with businesses that we're able to pull that out. I don't know specific the specifics of that case, but we, especially with the new tools that we have to be able to offer to businesses to give them a package to say, uh, it, we want you to expand here. We want you. This is what we're we're willing to put on the table. Then. Um, we we have a much stronger hand uh, as they consider other states, other places. Uh, I don't know the specifics of that case. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Woodard. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, on the uh, recent job numbers, just to get back to that, on some of the job growth, you don't have the specific sectors, but do you know the difference uh, between how many of those jobs were public sector jobs versus private sector jobs in the last uh, jobs report? Uh, Ms. I, Mr. Chair, uh, Representative Woodard, I don't have that data with me right now. I, I apologize. I focus more on the um, how we're comparing to our other states. I apologize for not bringing the other data, but I'm happy to get that information to you. Well, um, Ms. Babine, there's no apology necessary from you. My, what, I, what I sketched out is the topic, and I'm also not faulting anybody for your questions. They're, they're very good ones. Um, but uh, the point was to, to compare uh, where we're at versus where Wisconsin is at. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm assuming you've got all this data and can bring volumes. Um, yes. But uh, And if members, certainly if you have follow-up questions as well after this hearing, um, I'd uh, offer deed services and answer to those questions as well. Representative Woodard. Hi, thank you, Mr. Chair. So um, in looking at Wisconsin's job numbers, do you know how much of their job growth was in public sector versus private sector versus ours? I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, subsidizing... And I'm sure that that'll, that'll be one of my follow-up questions for, uh, for later. But um, you talked about luring companies in. Could you, could you talk to us a little bit about how subsidizing some of these big companies 
uh, to come in, so providing subsidies to big business. How does that affect locally homegrown entrepreneurial businesses? And uh, you know, I, I often talk to small businesses in my district about um, how they feel like they are subsidizing the ability for Shutterfly to come into into Minnesota by paying very high taxes, and that that's great for Shutterfly, but it's very difficult for those companies who are homegrown entrepreneurial companies trying to survive in a tough business market. Uh, can you kind of talk about how does Deed look at that? Uh, you know, you're picking winners and losers. How does that affect the losers? Um, Ms. Baybine, and I don't know if you were here for Professor Shaver's uh, point about, uh, and I think the point that he was making is many of the Fortune 500 companies that uh, are here in Minnesota didn't relocate here from somewhere else, to your point, is that they actually grew here in Minnesota. We were talking earlier about, uh, you know, once you get folks here in Minnesota and growing in Minnesota, you can't, they'll never leave. Um, which uh, I just wanted to make sure that you were aware of that point as well. But to uh, Representative Woodard's question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Woodard, uh, one point that, that we see, one thing that is when we talk with businesses who are expanding and relocating, the, the larger businesses that, that you're referring to, one thing that really works in our favor when we talk about other reasons uh, why it's great to do business in, in addition to our workforce and uh, other strong points that we have is uh, these larger businesses have great supply chain relationships. So we have a really strong supply chain for a lot of these businesses, which are those homegrown businesses, the smaller uh, mom and pop shops who, who support industry, who support uh, an ecosystem that supports these larger businesses. So that is uh, something that that we see as a strength, and then there's a a relationship there where uh, the the smaller businesses then are able to to feed into that and and benefit as well. Representative Water. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. So since you brought the supply chain, um, is there a warehousing tax in Wisconsin? <laughs> Ms. Fabian, I think everybody in the room already knows the answer to that, but. <laughs> Mr. I'll bet it's no. Mr. Chair, that is my understanding that no. Okay. And Mr. Chair, has there been any, any thoughts on the part of DEED of how the warehousing tax will affect uh, businesses like, you know, some of our big third-party logistics providers and uh, small retailers, large retailers, and, and the effect that will have on, on uh, business growth? Ms. Bateman. Mr. Chair, Representative Woodard, uh, we at Indeed, think that Minnesota is a great place to do business um, with all, all across the board, the things that Minnesota has to offer. And as you can see in the where we rank in education and job growth and GDP, uh, we think that we have a strong case to sell here in Minnesota. We know that that the that ta tax is um, something that businesses are concerned about, and we are, are talking to businesses about it and hearing from them and sharing that. Um, with the administration, but we think that Minnesota is uh, a great place, great place to do business. If I, if I might, just prerogative on the on that particular point, have you been hearing from companies on the warehouse tax about when they're making decisions about where to where to locate? Uh, the concern that's been raised is if they, you know, if we wait until April of next year to make a change there that some will have already made a decision. Is that something that's that Deed is picking up, or is that not something we've been hearing yet? Mr. Chair, I, uh, if our business representatives have heard that, it hasn't been filtered um, to me. Uh, I don't know what if the commissioner has heard, heard other things. Um, I, I have not heard that or concern in the conversations that I've had. And the only bit that I've picked up is most of the small entities, um, their warehouse uh, decisions, they've, they've got to be local, so they're not going to, but some of the national organizations uh, have the opportunity to perhaps go to Eau Claire or move their warehousing operations into Iowa, but they've got to make those decisions sooner than, than April. Mm -hmm. But it's been, literally, that was one person who made that comment to me. Most of the, the smaller folks have said, no, I'm keeping my warehousing here in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I just wanted to see if there had been more than just my what I pick up uh, anecdotally. Representative Woodard. Thank sorry, you, Mr. Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair. Or, sorry, Representative Woodard. Mr. Chair, to that point, sorry. Happy. Um, I've been hearing the same things that you have, the same concerns from people. I've had a number of businesses say, we might stay, we might go, but we got a plan. So I think you raise a very good point, and we should be reacting to this sooner rather than later just for purely planning perspectives. Sorry to interrupt. It'll never happen again. 
<laughs> we'll hold you to that. <laughs> Representative Woodard. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Hoppe. Um, just on a final line of questioning here, on you know, education has been mentioned by the professor and, and now by you as well. So if we compare education in Minnesota versus education in Wisconsin, since that's the purpose of, of the hearing, um, what does our um, achievement gap look like versus Wisconsin? So while we may have uh, the largest number of high school graduates, we also in the state have the, the nation's worst achievement gap when it comes to kids of color and their ability to achieve. We have some of the largest school districts in our state graduate 50% of the kids. Is that a concern of DEED? Is that a concern of, of companies as they look at where they want to locate and whether they want to expand in the state? Ms. Bayman? Mr. Chair, Representative Woodard, uh, that is absolutely a concern of DEED and a concern of this administration. Uh, the, the companies right now know that we have a, a great workforce and they can see investments that uh, investments that Minnesota is making and things that Minnesota is doing to reverse the achievement gap problem. So things that took place uh, across state government in the last session, um, early childhood education, all day, all day K, the other investments in both uh, K-12 education and higher education <coughs> are something that really supports uh, this pipeline and the, as Representative Marquardt says, the world's best workforce and that, that connects right into the work that we're doing from our uh, employment side of our organization to have that feed into training and make sure that we are aligning uh, uh, workers with the skills that they need uh, to be successful with businesses um, where they have gaps and that and that they need um, skills so if we we're looking at the achievement gap problem. The administration is looking at the achievement gap problem, and I think we've taken some some strong steps to work to resolve that. Thank you, Ms. Baybine. And folks, I got four. I got eight minutes left, and four people on the list. So if you can just kind of keep that in mind as you ask your questions, Representative Davids. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and to Ms. Baybine, you've been talking quite a bit about the past and. In Minnesota has been has quite a uh, admirable track record over the years. I think we just made your job a whole lot harder this year, uh, and I'll give you four examples. One is the success tax, the tax, the fourth income tax here that hits people such as myself very very hard. You've got the uh, ag repair tax, the business to business tax, the telecom tax, and the warehouse tax. These are taxes that neighboring states don't have, and I have to say that this hearing and I you never fault a commerce chair or a past commerce chair for anything <laughs> but that being said Wisconsin is the least of my worries the district I'm so fortunate to represent borders Iowa and Wisconsin we haven't even talked about South Dakota North Dakota and Canada so the district I'm so privileged to represent borders Iowa and Wisconsin and we are getting creamed we are getting creamed it is not good. For example, a John Deere dealer in Caledonia that sells a $500,000 to $700,000 combine comes in, comes in with a $50,000 repair. That's about $3,500 more. You know where that guy's going to take that combine to get it fixed? He's going to walk on Iowa. Or the John Deere dealership in Preston. That combine's going to get fixed in Decorah, Iowa. So Wisconsin's really the least of my worries. I have huge worries about what Iowa's doing. Iowa uses their lottery money for economic development. So I think we made Deed's job a whole lot tougher. And it begs the question, if we're so good, why do we have to bribe people to come here? Why do we have to pay so much, millions of dollars, to get businesses to come here? If I'm a business and I see the fourth income tax tier, ag and business or, uh, equipment repair, telecom tax repair, warehouse tax, and I love Minnesota. All the businesses I've started have been in Minnesota. But I, it begs the question, why would I start one now? How do, you, how do you answer somebody like that? I'm getting creamed on there. My implement dealers are very angry. When the governor said he's going to get at Farm Fest, he's going to get rid of the ag tax, and now he's not. That makes my farmers very angry. And I'm just a poor farm boy from Section 20, Sumner Township, <laughs> Fillmore County. And you have to realize that if there's one thing you don't do is upset a farmer. It just wrecks your whole day. The poor farm boy who's talking about being hit by the success it, tax. It's, it's, <laughs> all I can say is what a country. So, so Ms. Bayby. 
just think about it. Ms. Bain, why, in spite of all this, there's so many people to, to finish the question. Then why are there so many jobs being created in Minnesota right now? Well, no, that's, <laughs> that's not my question. Is my question Howard. is, Ms. Bain, have have you taken into account? Have you do have you're, you've been talking about the past? Mm -hmm. Have you made any projections for not you, but your agency made any projections for the future on how? The success tax, the ag tax, the telecom tax, the warehouse tax, all these business to business taxes may slow down growth. There, I knew there'd be a question there somewhere. Thank you, Representative Davis. Ms. Bevine. Mr. Chair, Representative <coughs> Davis, oh, we, at, we at Dean, um, I'm not sure if we've looked specifically at, at projections um, with those taxes, but we know that, that taxes don't tell the whole story. Uh, our business development team is busier than ever with the phone ringing with companies wanting to do business in Minnesota who are looking to expand and, and locate here. Uh, we, we know that the, what, what happened last session was that we have, uh, we look at what we wanted to invest in and we wanted to invest in job creation and and growth here in Minnesota and so we look at what those new tools that we have um, Minnesota Investment Fund offer and job creation fund to offer businesses in a real, real significant way and that is where economic development is every state has um, Based larger pots of money, Texas has a $200 million closing fund. Um, the fact that we now have $54 million to, to work with over the biennium and work with businesses um, puts us in the game, whereas um, we, weren't, uh, we weren't able to, to offer the same types of things before. So we know that uh, lower taxes don't necessarily equal a more prosperous economy, that um, we're looking that companies are looking for um, high value, high performance states, not necessarily just the lowest tax states. And well, like, yeah, yeah, I know, Representative. <laughs> and, and Ms. Baybine, I'm not surprised that your phones are ringing off the hook because all businesses are looking for a handout. Uh, they're looking for free stuff, and that's you know, I think somebody earlier said you're picking winners and losers here. Why can't we let the market do some of that? Um, I. I'll talk to you afterwards. I want to number someone that when the implement dealers call me and the farmers call me, I'm going to refer them to you uh, so you can uh, uh, tell them how great everything is. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chair. Thank you, Representative Davids. And Representative Zellers and Representative Schoen, we've got a couple minutes. Representative Zellers. Sure, I'll be quick, Mr. Chair. And, uh, and uh, Ms. Babine, thank you very much. And uh, although you're never supposed to blame a Commerce Chair, I would have, uh, he, you should go to the chair and say a little warning about the guys on this side of the table would have been <laughs> fair. <laughs> tell you how. Uh, doing great. Yeah, oh, she's doing great. Uh, however, I had a couple of questions and maybe a couple of suggestions to represent David's point. Right now, up on the, uh, the uh, North Dakota, South Dakota border, they're implement dealers getting ready uh, for not only the fall harvest, but are offering free, uh, free shipping if they'll come and bring your combine or your tractor for repair over to Fargo. And those are diplomat dealers in Detroit Lakes, Fergus Falls, Alexandria. And uh, I, if, I, if I were you, I would go back to the office and uh, <laughs> at least have a stern lecture to somebody that didn't tell you about the Cargill ADM deal, because that was huge. And uh, there's a lot of people in agriculture that have not hauled wheat or barley west. It's almost always east. You bring it to Duluth, you bring it down to the t Twin Cities. Uh, very rarely have we brought it west. So I would uh, at least have a stern lecture to somebody back at the office about not bringing that one up to you. My specific questions about Minnesota versus Wisconsin is manufacturing. Um, that is where I think we have an opportunity to re-import some jobs with smart factories. Uh, I'm curious as to where we are with Wisconsin versus Minnesota when it comes to that specific job area, uh, and not just past, but what we're seeing in the future. Who's Bayway? Um, Mr. Chair, Representative Zellers, I. Um, on the manufacturing Wisconsin versus Minnesota, I'm happy to look into that further. I don't, I don't have that data, so I'll get that for you. Thank one you. more question on higher ed, Mr. Chair. So, and this is another one, and, and you know, you said that the phones are ringing off the, the hook from uh, companies that want to come to Minnesota. Um, if there were one committee I would bring those to, it would be here. We'll put Atkins and uh, Davids in a suburban and send them out, and maybe they could close the deal on some of these uh, jobs. I'll front the 64 bucks for gas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's on the plan. Yeah. 
you haven't yeah. driven in David's yeah. Suburban, you need a loan to fill that thing up. Help me get us to South St. Paul. Yeah. I'll give you a quarter of <laughs> But in all seriousness, uh, it, it rings a little hollow with us because, and, and it's with all due respect to you, but uh, we've heard a lot of things that we don't know here, and those businesses, if they are coming here, we should know about it as well. It shouldn't be a secret if we're trying to lure a business here. It should be something that we're all a part of. Chair Atkins and Chair Davids could do a great job for you. Chair Hoppy, they've worked on these together, but th we need to know those things. It shouldn't be at the end of it, well, we tried and then we got close, but we didn't quite get there. But my last question about higher ed, because it's, again, it's anecdotal to the Chair's point, but. We have a lot of our babysitters that are uh, moving on from Maple Grove or Osseo or Plymouth, and uh, not a lot of them are staying here. They're going to the University of Wisconsin in Madison. And my concern is uh, that once they get over there, they may not come back, or they may decide to go on to Chicago, because as long as I've started going this far east, what are our numbers from Minnesota versus Wisconsin kids going to going to the University of Madison and then uh, versus the University of Minnesota and then bringing them back over to Minnesota as a workforce? To the extent you have those at your fingertips, which I'm guessing. Well, Mr. Chair, it was a Wisconsin versus <laughs> Minnesota. I was specific to the I was just states. so proud to keep mine got accepted at Madison and went to the Carlson School instead. I think probably because of Professor Shaver. But uh, is that is that data that you guys follow or, or you can get from the higher ed folks? Mr. Chair, Representative Zellers, I'll get that from the Office of Higher Ed. They would have that data. Okay. Thank you. Representative Zellers, anything else? No. Oh, we've well, got freshmen shown over here, but we're out of time. Any, should we should we actually let him ask his question? Who says yeah? I don't. All right, Representative Schoen, I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's so pretty. I knew you would be here. Uh, Miss Babine. So uh, when we, we talked about uh, a couple other issues, but I want to go back to like markers of success related to um, and these aren't my words, these are other words used here, like uh, when we bribe or give handouts uh, to companies uh, or what I would call programs. Uh, how do those mom and pop shops or those entrepreneurial folks uh, that set up around them or are affected by them, do we have markers, for instance, the uh, great uh, program or the, the good things that we're going to be doing down in Rochester, Representative Davis with Mayo? Um, how do we track the markers of success with that? And do we have those programs in place for other businesses in the local economy? Mr. Chair, Representative Schoen, can you, what was that last part? The what I'm asking is, so we're going to, we're going to, we have programs, we're doing things for Mayo down in Rochester, just one example, or these other businesses that, that uh, the, the, the term used was bribery and handouts. Mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't use that, but mm -hmm. uh, how do we, what, what are the markers or how do we track that and do we have a program in place to track the uh, success in the local economy and the state economy when we do those things to say, well, we're getting a dollar thirty-seven back on our dollar investment or whatever it is. Mr. Chair, Representative Schoen, um, the, we have a number of indicators that we look at. So for the larger, um, larger businesses that may receive a Minnesota Investment Fund loan or uh, in the future a Job Creation Fund grant award, then they have specific uh, criteria that they need to meet. So we are tracking jobs created and private investment leverage. So for all our, our business or all our programs, we're tracking indicators and uh, so we can say what's the return on investment on this specific program. In terms of uh, maybe businesses that uh, we aren't working with directly. We still track indicators throughout the economy uh, to say what is uh, obviously, you know, unemployment rate is one and uh, job growth and ex business expansions that we just uh, released our business expansion report that, that shows um, even businesses that we're not working with directly um, where they're expanding. So new startups and pieces like that are all things that we can track and that we look at. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Schoen. Thank you, Ms. Babine. Thank you, everybody, for your questions. Um, one topic that I wanted to just tee up for a future, and that is we see all of these where our states are competing against one another. And uh, with governors, uh, um, I heard Governor Walker compared to one of the Kardashians with the way that he was talking about Minnesota the other day. and. Uh, my curiosity is if there is efforts where the states can work together as a region to try to attract folks rather than beat the crud out of each other 
um, perhaps there's opportunities as a region to work together to try to bring folks from ideally not just other regions of the United States but uh, internationally to locate here in Minnesota and Wisconsin and the Dakotas and uh, improve all of our uh, opportunities. Ms. Babine, Professor Shaver, thank you very much. And members, thank you for the discussion of that topic. Thank you. Um, the, uh, the next up uh, discussion of auto insurance modernization. By the way, uh, was Governor Walker here? We did invite him. We sent him a letter. I didn't see him. Any designee from the state of Wisconsin? You know, uh, Chair Sorry. Atkins, I have a good Are you relationship. Governor Walker, no? Well, I have a good relationship <laughs> with him and with uh, you know, the governor of North Dakota. You know, I have a plan that I could probably see how we'd work together real well. <laughs> Doesn't involve the current governor, but I could find my way to. <laughs> you're like you're like one of the Kardashians, yeah. Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and and I didn't mean to speak about bribery and uh, handouts. Oh, you did way. too. Uh, <laughs> but go on. I don't mean to come on in a negative way. I mean it's always good when it comes to my district, and they're just fine, of course. <laughs> but but that being said, uh, one other issue that we didn't hit at all was the foreign royalties and what's happening to IBM in Rochester just being decimated. So if I could talk to the deed folks on if we could stop the bleeding at IBM, that would be very helpful. But I didn't mean to speak about bribery and handouts in any negative type the of way. Foreign royalty, the foreign royalty? You're talking about the new baby? The, yeah. And sending? Okay. George. All right. So um, just wanted to be clear on that. We have the next topic up is in auto insurance modernization. Uh, we have uh, Professor Flegel from, uh, from William Mitchell uh, to give us a brief overview of uh, where we've come over the last, and I think I saw Representative Davies, Senator Davies, uh, Justice, or uh, Judge Davies, uh, who was the father of the No Fault Act in 1973 or 4, Jack? 4. four. See, I was, we're, so we're about to celebrate the 50-year anniversary of, uh, or 40-year anniversary of the... <laughs> <laughs> I had my Achilles operated on. Did everybody catch that at the outset? A lot of, lot of pain meds have been ingested in the last six weeks. Professor Flegel, welcome, and thank you for your willingness to provide an overview for us. Uh, good morning, uh, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, my name is Will Flegel, and I have uh, served uh, at the Law School for Legislators, uh, which a number of you, I believe, have attended over the course of time. I also had the privilege of being appointed by the Minnesota Supreme Court to the no Fault Standing Committee, which is the organization that uh, monitors and uh, supervises uh, no fault arbitrations in the state. Um, I've been asked to, um, as you begin addressing your topic of, of consideration for modernization of the uh, no fault automobile system, to uh, start with a basic uh, uh, primer to hopefully help inform your decisions and deliberations. Um, there is a, a some material that I, I prepared as a short uh, summary or reference, uh, which, which you may have. Uh, basically, the system that we're engaged in a discussion about uh, relates uh, to automobile accidents and specifically to the injuries that occur in consequence of them and the uh, utility of a system that adjusts uh, in an orderly fashion uh, the payment uh, of medical expense and reimbursement of wage loss and other other types of benefits. This is a non-fault based system which operates very similar uh, in many respects to the workers' compensation system where no one uh, need be shown to be uh, at fault before there's a, a source of reimbursement of medical bills and wage loss. Um, this addresses fundamentally what have been historically since uh, it was created in, in 1974 uh, smaller type of claims, uh, claims where there's a dispute over whether a specific type of treatment, a specific uh, medical bill should or should not be paid. Is it reasonable? Uh, was the treatment necessary? Is it related to a motor vehicle accident or some other causal mechanism? And the system that was created by the legislature and that has been in process now uh, for 40 years um, is uh, one that addresses those typically smaller claims. Obviously, as the cost of medical care has increased, uh, some of those smaller claims have uh, become more and more sizable. Um, with respect to the basic benefits that are available under the system established through the legislative creation of the No Fault Act, uh, these are briefly addressed uh, in the materials um, at, uh, at the second page. Uh, the fundamental thing that I was going to remark upon is the goals that the legislature observed uh, when it created uh, this, uh, this system. Uh, they, they were to create a fair balance that served the interests of, of those who might be injured and those responsible for insurance. 
one of the primary goals of uh, the legislative uh, 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 authors of the uh, of this act created was uh, to assure that uncompensated injured persons uh, were promptly uh, paid, but also to avoid overcompensation, uh, to assure that any payment that was given was uh, calculated to address a specific and genuine need. Uh, it inc the other fundamental goal observed by the, uh, the legislative authors was uh, to encourage appropriate medical and rehabilitation, rehabilitation treatment uh, and to speed the administration of justice uh, so that individuals in need of medical care where a controversy genuinely existed could look to a system that would quickly uh, determine whether or not the bill was to be paid by this source or another source or not to be paid. The benefits in place fundamentally establish a wage loss compensation up to $20,000 for an accident to be paid uh, at $250 per week. As you address the topic of modernization, it might be worthwhile to observe that um, the fundamental changes that occurred in the No Fault Act and amendments to uh, try to keep pace with uh, increasing costs and needs fundamentally were made in the 1980s. 1984 saw the last increase in wage loss uh, from $200 per week to $250 per week and increased the maximum coverage from $10,000 to $20,000. Uh, similarly, in that year, 1984, replacement services, those things that would pay or reimburse for an injured person to hire someone else to help them with services that due to a disability they were unable to do, were increased from $15 a day to $200 a week. Um, funeral benefits, which is another payment under uh, the Act to the extent that uh, a victim of a motor vehicle accident uh, did not survive. Funeral benefits were last increased in 1985. Uh, from $1,250 to $2,000. These uh, benefit systems, medical for example, is up to $20,000 of coverage uh, per accident. Uh, rehabilitation benefits to assist in getting someone back to work who has been injured uh, are also available under the system. All of these benefits are uh, the subject of where a dispute exists, a resolution through an arbitration system rather than the court system. Uh, and that has been, uh, I think, uh, all of the stakeholders would tell you, a, a system that has largely worked and been successful uh, in that as opposed to uh, the, the court system which draws its, its budget from the, the general fund, um, the entire cost of operating the arbitral system that resolves disputes is passed on to those individuals who use the system through a combination of fees that are exacted from individual claimants and from the insurance companies uh, against uh, whom a, a dispute is specifically raised. Uh, that system addresses approximately, and this has historically been the case for at least the last decade, um, five to 6,000 uh, claims or disputes uh, each year uh, which are resolved without the need or resort to the uh, court system and the expense and, and somewhat slower operating machinery that our, our courts uh, uh, afford due to the more deliberate uh, nature of their uh, their rules and their processes. Uh, the typical uh, no-fault claim is from the date of filing to the date of disposition uh, roughly six to seven months uh, compared to a, a system that can be considerably longer uh, through the courts. So uh, I guess in, in summary that provides a basic overall outline of the system um, and the, the history of the, the benefits that it seeks to address. Uh, the system has successfully processed um, uh, many claims since its initiation. And uh, to the extent that the, the law is a clear outline of what is and what is not subject to payment, it has uh, worked efficiently over the course of time. Um, uh, just in conclusion, I would simply observe that, that some of the, of the, the changes that have been made in the system have not occurred for some uh, time. The arbitration uh, system itself adjusted the amount that it would limit uh, cases uh, to from 5,000 to 10,000 in 1991. Um, and most of the more recent changes from 2000 to 2006, which was the, the last period of, of change, uh, looked for ways to find economies in the system, for example, 
individuals who were seniors and no longer employed uh, did not uh, necessarily uh, need to have wage loss coverage and were permitted legislatively to opt out of it at a cost savings. Uh, but Mr. Chair, that, that provides a basic overall summary. I'd be happy to address any questions uh, that you may have. Are there questions for Professor uh, Like I had, I was just trying to jot some notes. When was the last that you said the funeral benefit now is uh, 2000 pardon me. $2,000 as of the last time it was updated was when? 1985. Is that and that's true of it looked like there were a number of other benefits the last time they'd been updated was uh, 1984 okay. All right, thank you. Thank you and uh, if you're able to stick I don't know if there'll be follow-up questions, but if you can stick okay. around, please thank you remain. Thank you um, My understanding we've got uh, kind of two um, two groups uh, that have been meeting on on somewhat parallel tracks there's uh, a group of uh, plaintiffs and uh, and insurance companies uh, mr. Ronan and uh, mr. Godfrey um, are here to, to represent. I don't know if you guys are going to testify together or, or uh, uh, immediately after one another. And then there's also a, a fraud working group or, or fraud prevention working group that uh, I give a lot of credit to my counterpart in the Senate, Senator Metzen, as well as Senators Jensen and Gazelka. Is that right, Faye, who have been leading up that uh, effort? And we're going to hear from representatives from, uh, from that group as well. But, gentlemen, if you just identify yourself, welcome to the committee. Thank you, Chair Atkins and members. Uh, my name is Rich Runin, and I'm here with the Minnesota Association for Justice. Uh, thank you, Chair Atkins, for inviting us uh, and members of the committee. My name is Paul Godfrey. I'm the managing attorney for Farmers Insurance in Minnesota, and I was uh, with the group working with uh, Mr. Runin. Okay. And again, welcome to the committee, gentlemen. If you just proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Chair Atkins and members. First, I'd just like to say thanks for having us here today so we can discuss kind of the hard work that we've put in to um, just address some of these modern, these things we need to modernize the no-fault system. Um, uh, we've had numerous meetings over the past several months uh, to discuss uh, reforms for the no-fault act and to modernize it. And everybody was asked to come to the table, and most people were there. Um, many of the issues we're discussing are common sense reforms that everybody agrees on. Some are more difficult, but through hard work and compromise, we've, we've come up with some agreements in, in issues in the no-fault system, both from a, a consumer standpoint and in, uh, in the insurance company side. Um, but it's a work in progress, and we've debated and essentially agreed on a whole for, uh, host of reforms uh, to update this law. Uh, what we don't want to happen is for hotly contested issues to prevent progress and essential updates for the no-fault system, the updates that we all agree are needed and even required at this point. Uh, the no-fault act simply needs to be mo modernized and what I want to do is give you some examples of some of the discussions we've had and then I think Mr. Godfrey will give some other examples. Most of these are things that we have agreed on, some we haven't completely agreed on. So. Let me cite some examples for you. Uh, uh, Professor Flegel just gave you an example about the wage loss, uh, and, and this has not been updated since 1985. Uh, in, in 1976, our minimum wage was $1.80. In 1979, it was $2.30. Um, if you make 250, if you get $250 a week, that's essentially 6.25 an hour, which is less than our minimum wage is currently. So, a person that's injured in an automobile crash who get, who let's say makes $12 an hour, is going to get only less than half of what they would otherwise have if they were working. And for many of the families in today's economy who are living check to check, that's a big deal. If they're out for two to four weeks even, it can make the difference between making their house payment and their car payment and their insurance payment on their car and things like that. So this is something I think that we all agree uh, needs to be updated. And we've talked about the number of $500 per week, which would essentially double uh, uh, in 30, 38 years, it will dub, it would double what what it was 38 years ago. So um, the other thing we talked about is the funeral expense benefit. Uh, currently, that's two thousand dollars, and I've lost three members of my family in the past uh, three years. And you can't provide a funeral for two thousand dollars. You simply can't do it. And it's really unfortunate that a person who loses a loved one in an automobile crash uh, has the situation compounded when they can't even have enough money to provide a proper burial. So the number we've talked about there is about $5,000, which we think would 
definitely modernize this and get it to an area that uh, a, a proper funeral can be can be had. The other thing we've discussed in our meetings is some decisions that have come down uh, either through the court systems or interpretations of law uh, by various players in the no-fault system that, that have resulted in unintended consequences. One of those is, and I'm going to give you a few examples of those, there is a decision where a uh, person tried to uh, get paid for under the no-fault act a hot tub in their house because they had back pain. And the decision came down and said the court properly decided that that isn't something that the no-fault act was intended to compensate. And there's been issues with people who say I need an expensive bed because I can't sleep at night and things like that. The problem was this decision was then interpreted uh, by some companies to say we weren't paying for crutches, we're not paying for wheelchairs, we're not paying for uh, products that we get in emergency rooms. That's, that's not what that decision was intended to mean, and that's not what the No Fault Act uh, intended. So we w we'd like to address that issue, and the language is pretty easy on that. Um, the other thing that we have, we have at least talked about um, is having a person uh, available during an IME, many of you, an IME is an independent medical examination and it's, uh, it's the opportunity for the insurance company to dispute the medical benefits and they hire a doctor who will um, uh, examine our clients. Well, many of our clients <laughs> feel uncomfortable in that situation. They might have, it might be a minor, it might be a, t a, a person with a traumatic brain injury, it might be an 18 year old woman who doesn't feel comfortable being in a gown in front of a doctor that they don't know that they had no choice in selecting. And what we've talked about is an, a disinterested, uh, or I mean, I'm sorry, a, a, an observer who can't affect the examination but can sit in there and listen and, and um, make sure that uh, there's nothing improper going on and that the tests that, that they say provi were provided were provided. Um, and, and believe it or not, I mean, I just had an IME where the psychologist refused to allow, out of, of an eight-year-old kid, where the psychologist refused to allow the mother in the room. That's a problem. And so these, that's something that we've, we've talked about. Um, the, another issue is, another issue of reform is what's called a drop-down in family exclusion. In, in, um, it, it often is in umbrella policies. Um, the, uh, um, in umbrella policies, there are, there are issues where um, you're allowed to drop down from, let's say, a million dollars to 30,000 in coverage. These are people who are, are in, have experience, they're intelligent, they've purchased extra coverage, and because their family member is driving their vehicle, they have no idea, but because their family member is driving the vehicle and causes the crash, it drops down to $30,000. There's two cases, Bobinski and Bundle cases, both of whom um, I've had intimate knowledge with because my current firm had the Bundle case and my previous firm had the Bobinski case and I worked on it. And this, uh, I'll just give you a quick example. The Bundle case was uh, a, a young gentleman who lived with his mo mom and uh, dad and was driving in uh, his car and ran into a truck killing his mother. The insurance agent said, oh yeah, you're covered. Don't worry, they're just gonna pay your million in damages didn't happen because they had a resident relative exclusion and it dropped their policy down to thirty thousand dollars and it was it was accepted by the court the agent himself did not know that that's what it said so if you if you have umbrella policies you might want to look at it because right now that's the law um, the another thing we talked about was uh, the there's a, a case called mutual league of Minnesota cities and what it involved was a, a police uh, uh, a police car and if you're hit as a, a passenger in a vehicle that's uninsured or, or if you are a pedestrian and you're hit by a vehicle that is not required to be licensed under chapter 169 um, uh, then you um, there is essentially no coverage you can't even access your own coverage this is like plows police cars government vehicles and so um, under those circumstances, you can't even access your own coverage that you paid for. And sometimes the courts, as you members know, uh, tell the legislature something's wrong, you know, you need to address this, and this is what the court said. We recognize that the use of the plain meaning of motor vehicle result, will result in a class of accident victims being uncompensated by this act, including pedestrians or passengers who happen to be 
injured by any of the vehicles that are not required to be registered under Chapter 168. Uh, I said 169 before, I'm sorry, it was 168. And so they're, they're, they're telling you that, hey, we need your help, we need to fix this, but that's the way the law is written. Um, there's a few other things like uh, providers who hold bills for six months don't don't tell their don't tell uh, the insurance company that the person's even treating and suddenly they throw a pile of bills uh, to the insurance company and rightly so they're upset about that they get seven eight thousand dollars with no chance to um, you know uh, look at them see if they're reasonable set up an IME do any of that stuff so we've talked about provisions dealing with that um, the other thing is some providers are trying to uh, um, they're trying to make bring no fault arbitrations on their own behalf, not not w without the consent of the injured person. So a provider may bring a no fault arbitration. If if you don't bring all your bills in one no fault arbitration, the rest are waived, and it is the insured's claim. It's not a provider's claim, and we and there are many interesting ways that they're trying to do that at this point and that we need to protect the consumers um, and I think the the insureds the insurance companies want it that way too um, some of those providers are also putting improper liens on consumers wrongful liens liens that aren't allowed by law that's a problem and because it affects the person's credit and there should be a civil remedy if you if you have a lien that's improper uh, that is not allowed by law and you try to put that on in uh, a person who's been injured a uh, couple more, and then I'll be done here. The, uh, there's no fault deductibles now. Now, the, I, when the No Fault Act was created, it never it never uh, addressed or expected the idea of deductibles. If you have twenty thousand dollars in mandated coverage and there's a thousand dollar deductible, you only have nineteen thousand in coverage. The other thing that we see this on a lot is wage loss. Most people who are injured in accidents are out for a month or less. And just having a deductible of two hundred or five hundred dollars or one thousand uh, dollars basically eliminates those the, that that money that they need to get by that month. And so uh, we don't believe that those those are proper under the Act. Um, there is also a decision that came down called the Keist decision, where where um, it, you it, it dealt with uh, getting interest on past due med medical bills. You're allowed fifteen percent uh, past due in interest. Um, and this decision said you have to keep the providers have to keep billing the insurance company even after the insurance company has said that we're not going to pay anymore and even after the health insurance company has kicked in to pay and so the the provider essentially has to bill both insurance companies knowing they're not going to get payment from one insurance company and insurance companies don't want all that paperwork either but that's now the the standard because of that case um, the last thing I just wanted to address is, is motorcycles. Motorcycles um, are not covered under the No Fault Act. Um, unfortunately, most of the people who get injured in motorcycle accidents, they're pretty severe. They aren't required to have the mandatory minimum and no fault coverage. They're not in required to have uninsured and underinsured motorist coverage. And when these people get injured in crashes, and, and many of them who don't have insurance or don't, uh, don't have um, these they don't have health insurance the state ends up paying for that and so um, we would really like to see uh, motorcycles be part of the no fault act um, in closing I'll just say that there's really no dispute that the law needs to be modernized and uh, that's what we're here to try to you know fix and um, really there's been several significantly troublesome and unintended consequences and I think mr. Godfrey will talk to you and then we can ask any questions and despite what you may have heard after working with him I think he's a great guy <laughs> <laughs> thank you mr. Ronan mr. Godfrey welcome uh, uh, the group uh, I was invited to the group by Elaine love our uh, legislative liaison I think mostly to argue with rich um, and I, I tried to do that as much as I could but uh, we still were able to come to some agreement on some things uh, we weren't the only other insurance company there. American Family was there, Allstate and others were there as well. Um, thank you. Um, so, and uh, what I want to tell everybody is that uh, Farmers is willing to continue working on these issues to collaborate and uh, try to do what we can for all the stakeholders. Uh, that said, there are some things that, uh, in our view, w would be on our wish list, and one of those things is the elimination of balanced billing. 
if I go to an arbitration and I do a really good job and I get a claim denied, there's a $5,000 bill and I get it denied by a AAA arbitrator selected by the parties as part of the system, um, I did a really good job, and then there's a $5,000 bill out there that the provider can bring against their own patient, our insured. And uh, I think that's something that should be eliminated. I know it's not possible to do that sort of thing in work comp. If you have a work comp hearing and the bill is denied, they're not allowed to collect it from anybody. So that is one thing that I think should uh, still be looked at. And the other things that uh, we think should be uh, part of the discussion would be uh, some form of uh, treatment parameters and a fee schedule uh, because in our experience, uh, a lot of the reason for a lot of these arbitrations is there is a dispute about the frequency of the treatment and the rates for the treatment. There's also a dispute sometimes about whether it's any longer related to the accident. But we think those are the kind of things that would uh, uh, eliminate a lot of the arbitrations if there were treatment parameters and fee schedules. And I guess the, the other issue that is not really uh, on topic as far as AAA arbitrations but has to do with the tort system. Uh, Minnesota is only a no-fault system uh, uh, if you have a, a smaller injury. That is an injury that's not permanent, there's no disfigurement, and the treatment is under $4,000. Uh, that $4,000 number was set back in the 70s and I don't think it's ever been updated and that would be one other issue that we would uh, uh, think should be part of the conversation. Okay. Gentlemen, thank you, Mr. Godfrey. Thank you, Mr. Ronan. Thank you as well. Um, I think we're going to hold questions until we get through the, I've got a couple other folks that want to, that have signed up on the list, but uh, appreciate the uh, the overview. Thank you. Um, Next, from the from the provide fraud prevention, I'm, I'm not probably giving that group the, the right name, but uh, Mr. Johnson and Mr. Thrain um, also are on our on our list, and I think we all are anti fraud. I'm just messing with the whatever the not exactly sure what the group is calling itself at this point. Mr. Johnson, welcome back to the committee. Mr. Chairman and committee members, thank you, Bob Johnson, Insurance Federation of Minnesota. Uh, I'm just going to make a couple of pretty brief comments because there's a lot of kind of in the weeds issues here that we're just talking about that would be better safe for another day, details of the kinds of reforms that were just talked about. And we did have an opportunity in this past legislative session to actually have some discussion of those issues before this committee. But at least for purposes of today, and I think the broader picture of no fault modernization, where are we today uh, from when this law was passed in 1974, we know that the trend in the country the no-fault laws were passed in the 70s. It stopped. Nobody adopted them after the last one did when it reached some 20 states. Uh, the trend since then has been states have repealed their no-fault laws, and I think they've repealed them because they haven't served the purposes for consumers in the states. And that's, again, more details can be supplied to the committee on that. I think from the property casualty insurance industry perspective, auto insurers, and I represent a good chunk of them and work with you know, virtually all of them, uh, we would say the following. Minnesota's no-fault law is broken. It's broken. It is not serving the consumer the purposes that the law intended it was passed. Way back when, when that law was passed, the legislature still put purpose clauses on laws. I know they don't do that today, but you can actually look at the purpose clause and look at the five goals that, that the legislature had. And for time purposes, I won't go through those, but, but it's worth that exercise and we could give you more details on each one of why we think it's a, either being met or not being met. But the bottom line is that it's broken. It's not in serving the intended purposes. We're committed to you, Mr. Chairman, and the committee to this modernization, to the update, trying to fix what's broken in the system. In terms of how this impacts consumers, we're in a, about in the middle of the 50 states. So the question is, what are consumers paying in Minnesota? We're about in the middle of the pack, so we're not a crisis state. If you look at states whose auto insurance or no-fault systems have uh, more serious problems, there surely are others. But maybe, uh, Mr. Chairman, I would just flag three key areas that, that what I would say fit, or four areas, excuse me, that fit this, what's broken, what, what we recommend that this committee spend time on. The first one is medical cost containment. So our no-fault law was passed in an earlier era and decade, and every other insurance system in this state, every other insurance system except this one, has some sort of modern medical cost containment. Minnesota's no-fault law, chapter, chapter 65B, has zero, none. Auto insurers pay rack rate, if you will, for health care services. 
And that's unique. That's not found in any other system. I think it'd be worth the committee's time to even look at the comparisons. What do we do in Minnesota in the work comp system? What do we do in major medical? And what do we do in no fault? Well, I can tell you what we do in no fault is nothing. There are no medical cost containment tools. And why is that relevant? Out of the dollars that are paid out of the system, wage loss, medical, 90% of the dollars go to medical, 10% go to wage loss. And that PIP benefit box, 90-10. So we have to look at, at medical cost containment. Premium-wise, how does that translate? A, about 25% of all the premium that a consumer, that your consumers, that we all pay in auto insurance premiums, about 25% goes to that PIP coverage. That number has steadily risen through the years, and we believe a primary reason is because there is no medical cost containment, in addition to some other uh, reasons. But So that's the first point. The second area that we would strongly recommend, Mr. Chairman, it's one that you flagged, that the Senate has set up, the Senate Commerce Committee has set up an insurance fraud working group <coughs> chaired by Senator Vicki Jensen and Senator Paul Gazelka, co-chaired by those two. And they've started a process, uh, members you have in your uh, packet, a letter, I won't go through it at all, but just to ask you if you get a couple minutes to read the letter that we submitted to that working group a few weeks back. And the letter was submitted on behalf of the entire property casualty insurance industry. We are 100% united. Companies, agents, township mutuals, independent agents, MIIAB, the professional insurance agents, all of us have a unanimous thinking on, on what are the problem areas and what needs to be done in fraud. And, and, and why does it matter? Because fraud, if you, you can back up to former Attorney General Humphrey, talked about insurance fraud and put out information. That information continues to this day. Insurance fraud costs the average Minnesota family, and this is an estimate, about $1,000 a year in higher premiums and cost of goods and services, $1,000 per family per unit attributed to fraud. So if that's even close to accurate, and it's the number that you'll see the Commerce Department, our Commerce Department in their annual fraud unit report, you'll see a number like that reference. So insurance fraud is an area that we urge the committee, we have the letter there that represents the unanimous thinking of companies and agents as to what is worth the time, we think, to address, and you'll see No Fault Auto specifically and significantly addressed in that letter. Uh, the third issue area, Mr. Chairman, is uninsured motorists. Uh, we just think it's, it's part of the equation because we have a compulsory auto insurance system. Everybody is supposed to buy the pro policy when you drive a car, otherwise you've committed a crime. So how's that working? Uh, we estimate between 500,000 and 600,000 cars are on the road in Minnesota today without car insurance. We are not making progress. We are going backwards in Minnesota, the number of insured drivers. And we just need to do better. We can do better than we're doing today. And there's a, a lot of aspects to that issue. And the, and the fourth one, and I'll end with that, Mr. Chairman, is just the dispute resolution process. So the, the, the issue of, of modernization of the No Fault Act We've had some discussion. There's much more details that we can and should get into. Uh, we don't think the dispute resolution process, as it's currently in the no-fault law, and as it's morphed since its adoption, is again doing what was intended to do, which is to have small disputes go before uh, practicing lawyers to get a quick resolution. And it does that, but it's doing a lot more than that. And we don't. We think that a lot more than that is what was not intended and is what should be addressed in the system. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate the, the time here and the ability to just to flag for the committee those issues. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Mr. Thrain, welcome back. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members, uh, my name is Peter Thrain. I'm with Leonard Street and Dinard in Minneapolis. I'm here today on behalf of State Farm Mutual Insurance Company. State Farm insures over a million cars in the state of Minnesota, which I think the math works out to about uh, one out of every five vehicles on the road. At the outset, let me just sort of note that um, in response to the Chair's comment, I don't know that, that I'm qualified to speak on behalf of any particular track or any particular approach to this, but we very much appreciate the opportunity to share our concerns about Minnesota's no-fault system. And thank you, Mr. Chairman, for facilitating this conversation about auto insurance and no-fault insurance modernization. Uh, since I know our time is short, I'll avoid uh, addressing with the level of particularity that many of the other, a couple other speakers have talked about the system. But there's a couple key things I think need to be addressed. We share your concern and the concern of the committee and many of the stakeholders here that Minnesota's no-fault system needs modernization. Our law was first enacted, as it's been described, in the early 70s, and it's really been not subject to much change since that date. 
I think most stakeholders agree that appropriate, sensible, no-fault reforms are necessary to modernize our law, uh, recognizing that with the goals, they need to evaluate the goals of current benefit levels, keeping costs as low as possible for consumers, and protecting and limiting insurance fraud. But any meaningful effort at modernizing Minnesota's no-fault law must address perhaps the most antiquated element of the system, namely medical cost containment. Minnesota's system compensates for reasonable and necessary expenses. Remarkably, that's the extent of medical cost control in our no-fault system. At a time when health care reform and cost containment has dominated the national and state conversations over the last several years, Minnesota's no-fault law has not been the beneficiary of any part of that conversation or any part of those reforms. Quite simply, no state or federal coverage provides such unlimited cost control. If you look at Medicare, Medicaid, <coughs> state health plans, private health plans, the workers' compensation, this leaves the no-fault system very vulnerable to excessive utilization, unsustainable medical reimbursements, fraud and abuse. <coughs> you might wonder, perhaps some of the intense advertising we see lately is a consequence of our lack of cost containment in uh, no-fault medical care. Not only is medical cost containment necessary and overdue, doing so provides necessary flexibility to address other areas in need of modernization, such, such as scheduled benefits and other issues important to the uh, committee and our policyholders. Again, we welcome the opportunity to work with you. We look forward to continuing the dialogue, and thank you for your focus on this issue. Thank you, Mr. Crane. Um, and I, I did have uh, Ms. Rizzolo on the list. I had Mr. Carlson on the list. You guys wish to testify as well? Okay. Is there anyone else that desires to testify? Otherwise, we'll take questions if members of the committee have questions regarding this topic at this time. Representative Hoppe. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And I don't know, I guess anybody can answer this, and I've got some comments and questions. Going back several years, I'm, I'm glad we're talking about this. I think probably all of us here agree, and most of us in the crowd would agree, that we need to modernize the system. Um, and I think we need to, you know, a lot of the numbers that have been talked about in terms of benefits and, and paying for funerals and things like that, I think we do need to look at adjusting those. But I think we also need to look at who pays for that and are we looking just at policyholders paying for it? And, and I don't know what the answer it is, but I'm glad we're talking. It's nice to have the, the chiropractors and other medical people talking with the insurance companies. Um, Mr. Johnson brought up the uninsured rate, and the, the number that he just said was five or 600,000 cars in Minnesota. And for those that didn't hear that, that's a pretty amazing number. I don't know what the total number of cars is, but that's, that's pretty astonishing. Um, if, if half that number, if it were half that number, that would be amazing. So I think that is one of the things that we need to look at, and maybe there are other committees that should be looking at in addition to ours, but that, that should be alarming to every Minnesotan, not even just people that drive, but the costs there, everybody should be concerned and, and worried about that. Um, it's kind of off the top of my head here, but I think we have... Uh, good medical providers and bad ones. And I think sometimes there are, are bad examples and things where, where treatment maybe isn't necessary. I also think we have cases where the insurance companies should be um, better to work with with their treatment plans, with the providers or with their, their uh, clients. Um, and I think if we can all look at, and I'm assuming what the group will come up with, is looking at as we reform the system and talk about payments and who's paying and everything, looking at kind of the outliers, looking at the, the things that aren't in the norm so we can make this a better system for everybody in the state. Um, and I think that's it. I, I think I'll, I don't even know if I had a question there, but I think that th this is interesting and important. Um, and so I'm glad people are working this, uh, and I hope people keep looking at it, and uh, especially at an uninsured rate. I mean, if we're looking for a way to pay for this, and Representative Davids, you know, he doesn't approve of fraud. None of us do. But if, you know, people are paying higher premiums because of fraud, then he makes a higher commission. So maybe indirectly. <laughs> yeah. You know, so, I mean, I think it helps all of us. Farmer. It, it helps everybody in the state if we can figure out a way. And maybe if we can figure out a, a come together and figure out a way to have more people pay and actually get the automobile insurance that the law says they should have, Maybe that's a way to pay for uh, some of the better benefits and, and a way to start reforming the system. 
Have I spoken enough here, Mr. Well, Chris? actually, that was one of the topics. I had a question for Mr. Johnson and then for um, Mr. Ronan and Mr. Godfrey on the Mr. John, on the uninsured motorist. You know, I know the economy's been tough the last several years, and perhaps that's contributed to it. But do you have specific recommendations about how we could bring that number down? Because it is an alarming figure of a half a million drivers out on the roads or a half million vehicles. I'm not sure which one it was, but Mr. what can we do? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I it just... And we can follow up because I think there's a, a number of kind of chapters of this issue. But the, the key thing we think is, A, uh, we don't think the penalties are strong enough. And I know it gets controversial. I introduced a bill up here, uh, presented it, and committees were hesitant about beefing up the penalties. But here's the reality. If, if the cost of six months of coverage is a whole lot more than a $100 or $200 penalty, people with the resources who don't want to buy the coverage make a conscious decision, I'll pay the penalty assuming it's enforced. So I think that's one, penalties. Now, there are people that don't buy coverage because they can't afford it. So we have, you know, there's working poor, that's, a, that's another group. It's a, it's a legitimate real issue. Other states, Mr. Chairman, have looked at that. I, I don't have a proposal, but just to, for the committee's information, other states have looked at, do we try to get a cheaper coverage? Because the, the current coverage is minimum mandated and there's discussion about increasing the minimum mandates, but if you increase the mandates, there is a cost associated with that. So perhaps looking at uh, uh, at trying to get coverage more affordable for people who don't have the economics to pay the current premiums. And the third area, Mr. Chairman, and, and we've worked a lot with the DPS and the, the the government agency, you know, regarding the verification systems. And Chairman Hoppy had a, a bill on the verification systems. We have got to do a better job. And I know it's a work in progress, the modernization of the computers at the, at the agency that does the tracking. But from an industry perspective, we've got enough modern electronics and computers to be able to communicate back and forth between law enforcement, the agency, and the auto insurers. And we should get on track with that, that kind of a tracking system uh, to help law enforcement identify kind of at the point of stopping whether or not somebody's got enforced coverage as of that date. So I think, Mr. Chairman, at least those are three areas that I think are worth the time and would help those numbers. But, but you are correct, the down economy, there are some studies that I don't have here that have measured with every 1% increase in unemployment, there's almost a direct correlation. There's a 1% increase in that state in the number of uninsured drivers. So, huh. so, you know, so those numbers, I think, have oh, probably helped us you know, with the recent uh, turnaround and, and the job growth. Okay. Thank you. That's helpful information. Um, and then for Mr. Ronan, and, and I, I was waiting for you to say that there ought to be like an auto insurance exchange um, where people could, <laughs> on a competitive <laughs> Apple. That would be way back to the first. <laughs> Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Ronan, my question of, of your, I meant to ask it when you were up there before, the, the folks that are participating in, in the group um, that you and, and Mr. Godfrey from the insurance company are, are part of, who's represented in that group? Um, and I, I don't expect it to be. Everybody, all that, state but American just family. sort of the generalities. M Mr. Chair, members, all state American family. Um, uh, I, I think we, you can help me out a little. Bit. <laughs> you are allowed to uh, phone a friend. Farmer, and farmers, <laughs> and then um, all of Mr. Franzen's clients. And PIC. A lot. PIC. Um, and I'm not sure who else. I think there's some people in here who probably know, but um, but we've been at the table. Um, significantly. I wanted to just make one quick comment on one thing. You wouldn't be a lawyer without yeah. trying to sneak in one more comment to the um, would you no, on, on the first on point question. though on the first point if you could send maybe to the to the committee members or have uh, have it sent uh, just what the membership is comprised of. And okay. if the folks um, I, I look to Faye because Faye's like in charge in the in the Commerce Committee if if the on the working group there uh, what the membership is. I know that's still forming, um, but uh, so that we have a sense of who the members are and of those working groups, because I do think it's pretty far and wide in trying to be inclusive of various groups. Mr. Runa? Mr. Chair and members, um, the one thing I would say that could maybe help a little bit is there used to be a requirement, as many of you know, when you get your license tabs, you had to write, your, you had to show proof of insurance, and that law was changed, and I'm sure 
Professor Flegel knows exactly when that was. I don't know, but it was about, I think it was five to ten years ago. And you used to be able to have to prove that you had insurance to get your license tabs. And otherwise you'd be driving around without license tabs and be pulled over. That was changed, and I think that's one thing that could, happen, that could help. It may only mean that a person has insurance for a month or two because they have to ship, go get insurance to get their tabs. But that would certainly help... Um, I think this uninsured problem, at least for periods of time, and then if those people get in accidents during that month, it would be helpful. Uh, I suspect you may uh, you may see that proposed this coming session, Mr. Runa. Um, other questions for anybody that's testified? Other, we do have a couple more topics that we got to get through. But uh, to everybody who came this morning and provided us uh, some thoughtful testimony on this, this won't be the last that we'll hear of it. We'll be continuing to work on it in 2014. Gentlemen, thank you, and thank you to everybody who came. Um, next up uh, is discussion of the appropriateness of non-compete uh, agreements. Specifically, that's House File 506, I'll, it, which is my bill. I don't expect to wander over to that uh, that table because the, the bill itself, just to give a little bit of background, um, and Representative Zellers, I think you'll like this because uh, uh, this, this was actually, I believe it was taken verbatim by the Revisor's Office from North Dakota Law. I never thought I would put in a bill that was based on North Dakota, but here it is. So, Representative Zellers, if you want me to just pass this off for your authorship, I'm sure that they can. Uh, uh, a little bit of background. We've got, um, I believe, five folks who've uh, signed up to testify. A uh, little bit of background. This was actually uh, the idea for this legislation was brought to me by a, a constituent of Representative Houseman. Uh, who showed me the non-compete agreement that he had uh, been asked to sign and had signed uh, as a condition of his employment. It was very, very significant in length and geography, uh, much more than what I would uh, have considered reasonable. Um, but, you know, who am I? I'm not, uh, not a judge. And, uh, uh, but it was uh, compelling enough um, to me that uh, I thought that it bore the... Uh, uh, the makings of uh, potential legislation. Um, the point of the legislation last year, uh, quite frankly, was a shot across the bow of uh, some companies, I believe, that are that are really onerous in what they're demanding uh, relative to non-compete agreements. Very, very lengthy, um, very demanding in terms of geography, uh, and uh, uh, stymieing, in my estimation, innovation, because they put uh, certain employees in a spot where they can't afford to leave and they can't afford to fight, um, and they, uh, they end up uh, continuing to work for a company rather than going and forming one of their own or going to work uh, somewhere else. Uh, and uh, uh, I understand the basis for non-competes generally, but when they get to the point where they are so onerous in their terms uh, that they prevent somebody from ever leaving, then it becomes indentured servitude and not just a job. Uh, and it, uh, that's why places like North Dakota, Representative Zellers, uh, and we always look at Kurt when we talk about it because he's from there and a farm kid from there and we like that. And, um, but they, they found that it stymied innovation. So they adopted a, a law in North Dakota uh, that was pretty limiting in terms of where you could uh, use non-compete agreements. When I put this in, I expected to get a little bit of reaction. I got overwhelming reaction. I got the Minnesota medical doctors and all sorts of people I didn't expect to hear from. Um, who felt that they had been chained into uh, really onerous uh, non-compete agreements. I also heard from the other side saying, are you crazy? Uh, this goes way too far. Uh, and we've got, uh, we're a med tech company here in Minnesota, and we're really concerned about, you know, we make this huge investment in people, and then they leave us and go to work for a competitor down the street and take all our secrets with them. Um, so it was, uh, it struck me as a topic that uh, uh, bore some, uh, some need for uh, discussion over the interim. We've got some really well-qualified uh, folks here to, to talk about it for us, uh, and then we'll kind of see where it goes in the 2014 session. But in addition to today's testimony, I would invite people to continue to, to provide input. This is not going to be the final draft of what uh, comes about in 2014. I do expect to move forward with something. I'd invite you to contact me as well as members of the committee. With that bit of background and not going to that part of the table, we've got uh, five testifiers that have signed up. Uh, the first one is Shay Mandel. Uh, CEO of uh, Life Science Alley. And I probably messed up your name, but uh, you'll fix it for me. Welcome to the committee, and thank you for coming. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, every, I will literally answer to anything. Nobody ever gets my name right. Um, it is Shay Mandel. Uh, I am the Executive Vice President with Life Science Alley. Appreciate the opportunity just to share some information with the committee today, and I know you'll hear from other folks that we've been working with that will get a little more into detail around 
some of the provisions of the law, some of the implications, so I want to leave them plenty of time. We'll be very brief. Uh, I think most of you know Life Science Alley is the largest life science organization in the country here in Minnesota. We represent nearly 700 organizations that today employ over a quarter million Minnesotans. The lifeblood of our organizations, which include medical technology, biotechnology, pharmaceutical, renewable chemistry, renewable energy, is R&D. It's science, it's technology, it is patent, so you know, as Deed walked through uh, where Minnesota stands, we rank very high in our corporate R&D patents. These are the companies that we represent and one of the, the great assets here in Minnesota. Our companies produce therapies that improve lives, save lives, and what our companies ultimately do is invest heavily here in Minnesota. Success in the life sciences requires significant investment. Uh, we're talking about products that require substantial R&D, clinical trials, getting through the FDA process. We're talking about years and oftentimes decades of investment uh, in one therapy. But really the investment's in people. It is the people that do the work, research, develop, and ultimately go through the trials, go through the FDA process. So what non-competes are really about is that investment in people. And I know there's, there's always the question about, you know, this is an employer having an advantage. Um, you know, being able to have a reasonable contract, and again, Minnesota courts have long held on a case-by-case -case basis that non-competes can be reasonable. Uh, what our companies... Would you do us a favor, and I, I realized that as I was walking through it, I didn't even define what a non-compete agreement is. Um, and I'm guessing most members probably know that, but in case they don't, can you put some context in terms of sure. what Sure. I'll give agreement? very brief context, and I'll let my uh, far, le far sophisticated legal colleagues give you more in-depth. Um, what we're talking about is an employment contract, wherein one of the provisions has some parameters around uh, an employee leaving, going to a competitor and competing. Uh, one thing you will hear from the colleagues, though, I mean, I, you know, oftentimes that is the perception that somebody is stuck in a job, can't go to another job, can't go to another company, and that isn't inherently true. I mean, non-competes are reasonable around geography. They're reasonable around activities. And again, getting back to our companies, but what we do is produce proprietary knowledge. These are the kind of high knowledge, high income jobs that every state wants, that we have a lot more of than North Dakota and Wisconsin, uh, and that we want to continue to invest in. So the investment in these types of jobs and people comes with it, again, access to the creation of knowledge, the creation of products, and again, very much life sciences, uh, certainly that's who we represent here in Minnesota. But non-competes, those clauses that allow for a contract, which is mutual between an employer and employee, to create access to confidential information, not only do they protect the employers, but they actually incent that investment. And what the employees get is ultimately the kind of investment in training, in education, in experience that actually benefits their career. So this, you know, the kind of investment that our employees receive uh, in our organizations is part of what gives them long and distinguished opportunities here in Minnesota and other places. Uh, so again, I'll step back, but I just want to, you know, our last comment, uh, non-competes have been around uh, as long as we've done business here in Minnesota. They are important. They are a well-accepted practice, in particular in high knowledge, big investment industries like the life sciences. Um, and, you know, we look forward to working the, with this committee to ensure that Minnesota continues to stay ahead of those neighboring states in these jobs and, and being able to have non-competes and contracts with our employees is a key part of that. So, again, I thank the committee for your time. Look forward to working with you on these issues. Thank you, Mr. Mandel. And, uh, again, for members of the committee, I think we're going to hold on questions until we get through the test fires, and then we'll take whatever questions members have. Next up is Ross Platzer from... Uh, Employer Solutions Group. Mr. Platzer, thank you for joining us this morning, and thank you for some of the background materials you've been kind enough to email to me over the past few weeks. Thank you, Chairman. I, I did bring a handout, and um, I'll talk, um, I think, 
uh, more in generalities than specifics, although my proposal or my ideas are very uh, specific. Um, I was a lawyer for 20 years. I've tried to enforce these and have successfully enforced non-competes. I've defended them. Uh, I had one enforced against me. And now um, working for Employer Solutions Group as one of the owners, uh, we've got 60 internal employees. We've got 15,000 temporary employees, but each of the 60 employees does sign a non-compete. I read it last night. I talked to a couple of employees, even younger ones in the late 20s. They said these are routine. They sign them all the time. Why do we have employees sign them? Because we can have them sign them. Obviously, we've got unequal bargaining power. We're offering a job. A person wants a job. They're going to sign whatever we stick in front of them. Really, the nature of the agreement is whatever we say it is. Um, we try to be very lenient in ours, but a lot of people aren't lenient in theirs. And um, that really comes down to the culture of the company. So really, I think that the current regime uh, in Minnesota, based strictly on case law, is, is not really adequate. It doesn't provide uh, bright lines. Um, we've, I think, seven states in the country don't enforce non-competes, including California. Um, Mr. Mandel testified about medical te technology, which is very big in California. And from all the studies that have been out there, and there's three or four of them, it has not affected California's uh, technology business, whether it's in IT, computers, or medical technology. Um, as he said, Mr. Mandel, did, um, these have been done a long time, and I think, unfortunately, it's just business as usual. I think it's time to actually change uh, what's out there. And I think a statute will go a long way to doing that. But really, the two key things we're talking about are um, degrees of freedom for the employee. Right now, you can lock an employee down, have your lawyer send a letter to them the day after they leave that says, you know, basically, we'll sue your pants off. I've had those letters. I've sent them out, and I've received them. Um, very few employees can afford a two to $400 or more, depending on the firm you use employees. So basically, you've got to make a, a, a statement of whether you're going to live by that or not. Uh, many companies will reject you when they hear that you have a non-compete. So really, we're, we're hurting the mobility of talent and the mobility of employees and their livelihood. The really only protectable interests that legitimately can be protected, and especially since the Supreme Court's 2010 uh, U.S. Supreme Court's opinion on business methods, not every business method, not every proprietary piece of information is protectable. And the bluntness of most non-competes says whatever we think is confidential, whatever we think is proprietary, we're going to protect it or we're going to sue you if you touch it. So we've got a lot of, of intimidation of employees. We've got a lot of uh, intimidation of talent moving around. The truly only legitimate things you should be able to protect are customer relationships that have actually been created by the company and the investment in those under certain circumstances. Trade secrets, of course, if you can prove their trade secrets by current uh, intellectual property definitions. And of course, the solicitation of current employees, which would be interference with contract or, or, or a tort. After that, you're really going beyond anything you have a legitimate interest in. You can say we've always done it. That doesn't matter. That doesn't make it right. You can say we want to do it. That doesn't make it right either. It's time to set down in a statute some broad parameters and some guidance so that the courts can figure out what to do, employees can figure out what to do, and it's time to put an attorney's fee provision in so that if a company wrongfully comes after you and you can dig up legal counsel, that you've got a way to fight back. Because the thing that the Chamber of Commerce really <coughs> hates, and they hated this in the ban the box thing, is a legal fee weapon out there. They'll take just about anything else, but if you get legal fees and damages, they don't like that. I would propose, and I, I tried to sketch out here um, some of the ideas that I think would make a fair statute, at least as a discussion point, because nobody's thrown that out there. The North Dakota one is far too blunt. Um, they're talking about this in Massachusetts. They're having a hearing on September 10th there. <coughs> Thoughtful groups like I know this one is, because I've testified here before, should really form a working group um, as the uh, uh, no-fault people did, and, and get people on both sides of this. It's, it's time to get past the rhetoric of we need this, we need this. You can't prove it. The studies show it's not true. So it's really time to get down to brass tacks, get a group together, and start talking about what's really important in a specific way. Um, we need clarity. 
We have to let employees freely move as long as they don't take proprietary, truly proprietary information, which is customers and trade secrets. After that, that's just a, a, a risk of the marketplace that you're going to lose talented people. But you're also going to get talented people if you have the right kind of company. So it's really a marketplace competition as long as it's not unfair taking customers and proprietary information. That's how we run our company. And honestly, I've been on both sides of these. As I look back, I've been out of the uh, law now for, for 20 years in the staffing and uh, HR back office. Uh, there's got to be a fair way. We live not only in a national community but a global community. And we've really got to modernize the laws in a fair way that gives a bright line and some guidance to both parties. Thank you, Mr. Fletcher. Um, and again, we're going to hold questions until we get to the to the final testifier. We've got uh, next up is Mr. Gerber, Ben Gerber from the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. Mr. Gerber, welcome back. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Uh, I'm going to be really brief. This is uh, an issue of importance to many of our 2,300 businesses across the state, and I think we've heard a lot about big businesses that this impacts. It's also, we've heard a lot from some of our small businesses, mom and pop shops in rural Minnesota, as well as in the metro area. One of the things that we wanted to do and we were asked by the chair is to uh, bring in or, or to pr provide some, some background information. And so uh, uh, at the behest of some of our members, we went and at their suggestion sought out some of the preeminent experts in this field. Uh, I'd like to introduce you to um, Mr. William Pentelovich. He's a partner practicing law at Maslin, Edelman, Borman, and Brand. He has more than 30 years of experience in non-competes on all different sides. I'll let him talk more about that. Uh, and we also uh, have with us today, who when I, I'll get up quickly, uh, Melissa Rafan, who's a partner at Dorsey and Whitney. She's an expert as well on this issue and is lectured um, uh, and has also testified before this in other committees. And so um, with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Penelovich, and thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Good Chairman. morning, uh, members of the committee. Mr. Chairman, thank you for allowing me to speak today. Um, I was invited here uh, by the Chamber of Commerce uh, not to speak on its behalf, and I'm not here to speak on its behalf. I have uh, practiced as a business trial lawyer for nearly 40 years, and almost throughout the entire 40 years, I've had a, an active practice in the non-compete area. Uh, I've represented employers, I've represented employees, I've prosecuted uh, non-compete agreements, and I've defended them, not just in Minnesota, but in about 30 other states as well. I've also written the chapter on non-compete agreements in the Minnesota Business Torts Desk Book. And what I'm going to do today is try to condense for you in maybe five minutes the essence of what I teach in a three to four hour CLE course every year on the law of non-competes, just to give you the background. My goal today is to make you under, or help you understand what the current state of the law is and how it got there so you can have that in mind as you move through the, your process going forward. Non-compete agreements first came into existence with the uh, decline of the apprenticeship system in England. Uh, Non-compete agreements uh, first started being used in the 1600s in England and case law in England goes back to the 1600s. Uh, Non-compete agreements on their face are restraints of trade, and the English courts made an exception for non-compete agreements so long as they were reasonable and served a legitimate purpose. It is now the case throughout almost the entire uh, world where the common law, the English common law has been followed, so all the former British Commonwealth countries as well as a number of other countries, that the, there is a common law, a court developed law over the last three to four hundred years uh, governing non-compete agreements. There are some places uh, that have adopted statutes that regulate non-competes. And there are some stat states that have adopted statutes which essentially ban non-competes. The two states that for all practical purposes ban non-competes are California and North Dakota. Uh, there's about five or six other states that have statutes that regulate non-competes. I'm going to speak mostly about Minnesota today, but I will touch on, on other states as well. Minnesota first adopted the British common law rules governing non-competes in 1891 in an opinion by Justice William Mitchell. And since 1891, 120-some years ago, there have been over 100 reported Minnesota state court decisions, uh, several dozen Minnesota federal court decisions, 
and literally hundreds of unreported uh, trial court decisions in Minnesota regarding non-competes. And we have a very well-developed uh, common law governing non-competes that has become very well understood. Just to give you an idea of how nuanced and complex it can be, my, my chapter on non-competes covers 27 separate topics, which represent 27 separate hurdles that must be overcome in order to enforce a non-compete. And each of those 27 topics, each of those 27 hurdles, has its own complex set of rules that have been developed by the courts over the years. The fundamental rule is that an employer cannot seek a non-compete from an employee that is broader than necessary to protect the employer's legitimate interest. And in Minnesota, as in virtually the entire common law world, legitimate interests are defined as two things protection of goodwill, which is customer relationships, and protection of confidential information. The employer's got to be able to show that it is legitimately protecting its customer relationships and legitimately protecting its confidential information in order to enforce a non-compete. And the courts look at these on a case-by-case -case basis and have a very high rigorous standard that an employer must uh, meet in order to enforce a non-compete. And I will tell you that in my experience, <clears throat> probably one-third to one-half of efforts by employers to enforce non-competes fail because they cannot meet the rigorous standards the Minnesota courts have set up, these 27 different factors. It's, it's a very nuanced area. Um, in terms of scope, what the courts originally held was that they have to be not only protecting a legitimate purpose of the employer, in other words, goodwill and confidential information, but they also have to be reasonable as to time and scope. As to time, you'll find, if you read the Minnesota case law, that Minnesota courts generally enforce uh, a one-year non-compete without much question, though they will ask why you need that much time and sometimes will cut them back to six months, and I'll talk about the cutbacks in a second. Once it gets above a year, courts become much more skeptical about whether non-competes are enforceable. And you will find scattered throughout Minnesota case law some two-year non-competes, and in fact there's one case that enforced a three-year non-compete a long time ago. Um, but beyond that, and, and really beyond one year, they're very difficult to enforce. Minnesota has a, a rule that is not widespread in the common law world, but it, it's it's there's a number of states and jurisdictions that have it called the blue pencil rule, which allows a court that thinks a non-compete agreement is unreasonable as to either time or duration, <coughs> I mean duration or scope, geographic scope, to blue pencil it, to rewrite it, to cut it back, to make it what the court deems reasonable based upon the evidence before it. Another thing that's developed over the years is that geographic scope isn't always a very good way to determine what a non-compete should be. It was fine when you were trying to, back in the 30s and 20s, when these cases dealt with milk routes or paper routes, uh, to say you couldn't go back to your old route. But as, particularly in Minnesota, uh, the high-tech industry has adopted them. They have become less geographically based and more product and customer based. For example, and not he might say that if you sold widgets to uh, a certain group of customers, you cannot sell widgets to that group of customers for one year. You can sell widgets to a different group of customers, or you can sell the same customers to different products, but you can't sell widgets to those customers. So these are what are called product customer based non competes, and those have become very popular and very widespread. And again, Minnesota courts look very carefully at these to determine if they really are covering what the employee did. Because given, left to their own devices, employers would say you can't work for a competitor, period. And the courts just won't countenance that. I think one important thing to understand is that many Minnesota companies, and not just the big publicly held companies, but a lot of even smaller companies that are involved in technology or, or high-tech manufacturing, operate worldwide. And they compete worldwide and have employees worldwide. And many of those employers provide in their employee agreements that Minnesota law will govern the non-compete agreement. So if an employee is working in California, Hong Kong, Georgia, Minnesota law will govern. It's also the case that many employers, not all, 
uh, that have these provisions will provide that dispute resolution should be in Minnesota. Now, companies are able to do that if their headquarters are in a state. They're able to specify the law and the jurisdiction if their headquarters are in a state. Uh, under the Due Process Clause of the U.S. Constitution, that is considered a, a sufficient connection in order to operate in that way. And this gives companies in Minnesota the opportunity to have a uniform set of rules enforced if they choose by Minnesota courts for their employee force throughout the United States for sure and in many common law countries as well. Uh, this is an important aspect of non-compete agreements in Minnesota right now. Uh, it has become a hub, and Minnesota in some sense competes with New Jersey and Delaware, which are which both have laws essentially identical to Minnesota's on uh, non-competes, for controlling their employee workforces nationwide through the use of choice of law. The, I, as I say, I've been on every side of this issue, and I've litigated this issue in many, many states. Um, what I want to say about other states is I've spent a fair amount of time over the last 30 years litigating in Texas and in Georgia, uh, as well as Louisiana, all of which are states that have statutes that to some degree or another try to regulate non-competes. And I will tell you that the law in those states is no clearer, no better, and probably worse to deal with from both the employer and employee point of view than in the states that just have judicial made law. Uh, Texas is a great example. The legislature and the courts in Texas have been engaged in a tug of war for at least 20 years, maybe 25, uh, since the legislature chose to enact a statute. Uh, it enacted a statute. The courts tried to interpret it in a certain way. The legislature didn't like it. They amended the law to get around the court decisions. The courts didn't like it. They, they issued decisions which the legislature didn't like. They've been bouncing back and forth like that. And if you go into Texas right now, uh, and if you went in five years ago, if you went in ten years ago, and I've got a case down there right now myself, the law is still uncertain. Right now, there's pretty, the law here is pretty clear, and, and the gentleman before me mentioned <coughs> bright lines. I think there is a pretty bright line in Minnesota, and people who work in this area, lawyers and human resource professionals, understand it pretty clearly. Any statute you adopt, regardless of what it says, you know, how either extreme or mild it might be, is going to be a di essentially a disruptive technology for interpreting non-competes. And so what you're going to have is a period of years, and it won't be months, it'll be years or maybe decades after, after a statute's enacted, where there's going to be uncertainty as the courts try to sort out what the legislature means by whatever changes and how the legislature intended to change the common law. And unless you're going to dive in and change all 27 factors that get considered and address them, you're going to have that sort of a situation. Um, and I would, I would expect that like Texas and like Georgia currently, where, where they enacted a statute about three or four years ago, about which there's been a great deal of, of back and forth between the court and legislature, there would be years of back and forth trying to sort it all out. So, so better to I just, guess what I would better, say is... Better, Mr. Penelope, just to do away with it all together than to try to tinker with it? Well, no, then you have the California situation. And the California situation, uh, you know, there is one company I'm familiar with that when it was, that a, uh, it was a Minnesota company acquired a very large California business, and the first thing they did was move it out of California so they could impose non-competes on their employees. Um, I, I litigate in California quite frequently. There's all sorts of litigation in California about what the prohibition means, when it applies, how to work around it. It's, it's a cottage industry for California lawyers. Barring it completely didn't make the issue go away. But it would be good for lawyers. Just so Any of it would be good for lawyers. How many, no how many in the audience are lawyers? If lawyers. I could just see a show of hands. But <laughs> let, let, let me tell you what the problem is in California. If you don't have a non-compete agreement, your principal protection of your technology business is trade secret law and trade secret agreements that prohibit the disclosure of confidential information. There, the, the Minnesota, like most states, has adopted the Uniform Trade Secret Act, uh, which we refer to here as MUTSA. MUTSA is extraordinarily hard to enforce. You have to prove that there's actually been a misappropriation and prove that there's actually been damage in order to get any sort of relief at all. And so your, your, your most skilled people, your scientists and engineers, can go and work in relative secrecy within their new employer 
and you have no way of knowing whether they have or haven't disclosed confidential information until maybe perhaps many years later when something happens. And the point of the non-compete is you impose the non-compete to prevent them for a short period of time from going to work for employers. So they can't take your technology and immediately use it. And you don't have to have this high burden of proving they've actually used it. And just to give you an example, this actually arose in a case I had in Pennsylvania, which has the Uniform Trade Secret Act. A gentleman had downloaded the entire product catalog of his employer, which were to print out would be 21,000 pages, which included technical specifications and prices. Put it on a disk, got on an airplane, flew to the Netherlands and gave it to his new employer, which then put it on their server where it was accessible to all their employees throughout the world. He flew back to the United States. We found out, my, my client, which was based in St. Louis, found out about this about eight months later. We brought a lawsuit and the court said because because the issue is trying to get discovery in the Netherlands where we would have had to go. Because we couldn't prove that not only had they he'd taken it over there, loaded it on the server, and that then after that somebody had actually taken it and used the information for the benefit of the new employer, we could get no relief whatsoever. Had they had a non-compete with this gentleman, they could have prevented him from doing that and gotten relief before that. So. The tension here is you have a Uniform Trade Secret Act, which has a, a standard of proof that is nearly impossible unless you've got, basically it's like, it's like proving a murder in, in essence or, or a theft. Uh, whereas non-compete agreements are prophylactic. They're for a limited time, they have to be reasonable, they have to be limited, but they give the employers, particularly the employers who have very strong customer relationships to protect or very valuable confidential information to protect, uh, the protection they need. I, you know, I, the problem is I could go on about this for four or five hours. I'm not going to, but I'm happy to answer questions. Also, if any of the, any of the members of the committee would like a copy of the chapter, I would be happy to arrange with Minnesota CLE to uh, provide a copy. I was going to say, my chapter. guess, Mr. Penelovich, is that when you do a CLE, you don't even you haven't looked at a note yet today. And my guess is you could go for three or four hours without even consulting a note. So, the uh, we appreciate uh, your input. And you. uh, is it Rafam? Raf Rafam. Fan. Welcome to the committee. Thank you. Thank for coming. you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Are you able to hear me okay? Okay, terrific. I'm a partner in the employment law group at Dorsey and Whitney, but I'm not here in that capacity. I'm here in my capacity as the general counsel to the Minnesota Employment Law Council. And the Minnesota Employment Law Council is a group of about a dozen of the state's very significant employers. And MELC has very significant concerns about the proposed bill. Because non-competes, as Mr. Penelovich has indicated in great detail, is a very critical resource to protect the employer and employee relationship. Jobs are critical to the state, as we've heard for the bulk of the morning, and non-competes are very critical to jobs of these significant employers. I wanted to make just a couple of key points from a little bit of a different perspective than I think the other speakers have made from. Responsible employers make a very significant investment in their employees, and the investment is twofold. It's a direct investment in the way of training and development of skills, access to sensitive confidential information and client relationships, mentoring and professional development, and really divulging access to the ways in which the company does business and is competitive in the marketplace. So for a number of folks, the company truly makes them. The indirect investment that's made in them is in terms of resources, access to information, you know, global companies, overhead, resources to which no individual would have access on his or her own. Non-competes allow employers to protect their assets and share this information. An employee can pack all of her stuff into a shoebox, walk across the street and compete unless a non-compete is in place. And while I know, um, Mr. Chairman, you spoke about indentured servitude, I think that really doesn't look at the whole relationship. The investment that's made in these folks by our Minnesota companies is truly incredible. The second point is that non-competes really do allow employers to minimize the risk and the harm to them from departing employees. It allows them to take steps on the front end to minimize the harm and prevents employees from taking what it got from the employer and what made it for a limited period of time. And that really does 
go to the third point, which Mr. Penelovich spoke about. Courts have very narrowly defined the parameters of what is going to be enforceable, and there is a very careful look taken at non-competes, and responsible employers understand that and have drafted their agreements to be enforceable. Employers carefully consider what interests have to be protected and what assets must be protected when they are drawing the parameters. And there are safeguards that are built into the process to protect both sides. It is not one-sided. <clears throat> Non-competes really do allow for a win-win situation because employers are given security to give employees access to information that they understand will harm them when the employee walks out the door. I think far from it being one-sided or indentured servitude, the employee who leaves, and I think the example that was given where the gentleman flew to the Netherlands and then uploaded his stuff onto the server is a perfect example of, frankly, the power employees have when they depart to harm the departing employer. And finally, businesses need certainty. The landscape in Minnesota is fairly pro-employee, and we understand that. There are numerous exceptions to at-will employment, and employers understand that. But the case law around non-competes has developed against that backdrop. And to introduce a law like this would be an incredible game changer. I, too, have had clients who have made a conscious decision not to go into California because they don't feel that their intellectual property can be protected. And I think given the testimony we heard this morning about what a fabulous and dynamic and diverse environment this is for employers, this would have a very disruptive and negative impact. I'm available for questions as well. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I don't have others uh, on the list as having signed up before. That doesn't mean that others may not. But I did want to give members an opportunity for questions. Representative Davids, you've been on the list for like half an hour. So thank you for your patience. Well, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and this uh, is an area that I've dealt with quite a bit. I've bought and sold companies and uh, in the insurance industry type of thing. And, and so non-competes are extremely important because all I have to do is download the list of customers and off they go. So I've signed no competes of one year, two year, five years, seven years, went into them eyes wide open, cut the deal, and you honor the agreement. But maybe I could have some help from some of the folks at the table here, Mr. Chairman. The bill we have before us, which is supposedly the North, or is the North Dakota law, would that refrain me from still entering? Because if I can't have a no compete agreement, my business is worth nothing. I mean, if my employees, I sell it, sell a company, and my employees could just take that over, and it, basically, it, you have totally devalued my company because what is of the value is that two-year no compete, that five-year no compete, which I understand probably wouldn't be upheld, but they were agreements, and we have gone through that time. So, would this law still allow me in, to enter an agreement? Because I look at line uh, one. Eight, where it says following exceptions and then 1.9, does that allow me to still enter into no compete if, if both sides agree? Because if I can't do a no compete, my business is worthless. And I've done I don't know how many of these. Um, if this was the law, could I still enter into my no competes? Well, I, I'm not sure Mr. which kind of non compete you're asking about. There's a difference between a sale of a business non compete and an employee non compete. When you sell a business, the seller uh, often enters into a non-compete that the seller won't compete with the buyer. And the standards for that are slightly different, and the courts will uphold longer terms. If you're talking about the non-competes that you, that you as the employer had with your employees, as I understand the proposed bill, it would, it would bar them. I read it that way. Uh, Ms. Rafan? And, folks, I, it's not a huge deal when we're having an interim hearing, but you go through the chair just so that oh. there's, I'm sure there's lots of folks that will listen to this tape later on because legislative history is fascinating. Um, but uh, that way they'll know who's talking. Well, um, and, and Mr. Chair, and to the witness, I, I, I was thinking more of the selling of the business, but I've done both. I've had where employees have left. They've honored their no-compete agreements, and life is good in Minnesota. But so this one, this bill would not necessarily, I could still sell a company or buy a company and enter into no compete. But I, I mean, it would also be quite devastating if I have a key employee that takes the customer list and can just start ripping them. I mean, it, it really devalues my business if I have no protection. 
Mr. Chair, I, love it. Uh, I believe that as this bill is written, and, and this is a, this North Dakota bill is essentially the California, the North Dakota statute is essentially the California statute, and the, and that allows non-competes when you sell a business between the buyer and the seller. This bill, as California and North Dakota, bar employer-employee non-competes. Well, Mr. Chairman, that could be that could still make my one of my businesses worth absolutely nothing. And then, Mr. Chairman, to the witnesses, how would this affect government no competes uh, employees of government? I'm thinking like Edward Snowden or something, you know. Um, but but would this apply to government? Because if a government has an employee that has trade secrets of the government, um, does this apply to government? Or is this only private business, Mr. Ms. Rafan? As I read it. I don't see a distinction between government and private employers. I see it impacting the employer-employee relationship. So, Mr. Chairman, to the witnesses, so a government employee working in some research facility someplace could just take it and give it to the classified information or the technical information to anybody. If, if, if this bill was law, a government employee could take that information and sell it or give it any time they wanted to. Uh, Mr. Penelovich? Well, yeah, I mean... I'd, I'd make a distinction here. If you're talking about somebody who's doing classified government research, they, they're going to be subject to all sorts of laws. But take take a state employee, for example. Let's say you had a, an employee in the Department of Agriculture who was doing research for the state of Minnesota that led to potentially led to patenting something that may have value. I don't know. I've never seen a non-compete agreement between a government agency and an employee, but I could imagine that if you had somebody like you know a scientist working for the state and there's a potential of commercializing uh, what the employee was doing for the benefit of the state you know it would bring revenue in that the state might want to have a non-compete and then this would of course bar it and under the current law if the state wanted a non-compete it would have to be reasonable and you know fit all the other parameters the courts have laid out yeah, I suspect the better example representative Davids may be some of the research that's taking place at the University of Minnesota or other public institutions um, where there's I suspect that there's agreements between the university and the and the researcher on how that is going to be utilized and who owns the patent and so forth um, thank you mr. The, chairman thank you representative Davids uh, on, on the practical side of this are you um, and both of you I assume have active practices relative to, to non compete uh, mr. Penelovich has, has talked in in uh, further detail about that. Are you aware of situations with non-compete agreements where they simply go uncontested because they're too costly? Um, and the follow-up to that is, is there an average or a ballpark in terms of, from the employee's perspective, how much it would cost uh, to contest a, uh, a non-compete? Is it, you know, can you get by with ten grand, or is it a $100,000 fight? Or well, well Mr. Penelovich. what I can tell you is, first of all, um, in my experience, employers are very selective about when they enforce non-competes. They don't enforce them against everybody. I, I've yet to run across any client of mine who's enforced them against every client, everybody they could enforce them against. They make a, a, a judgment as to whether it's really important to them, number one. Number two, um, I because my name's all over the internet doing this, I get calls from individuals all the time who are subject to non-compete. I frequently will look at them and if, if I think that the employers ask for something that's unenforceable, I'll on a pro bono basis myself write a letter to that employer and say, it's overbroad, here's why, and here's what's going to happen if you try to enforce it. And I've had very good success in getting people to back down. I don't know what it would cost, you know, uh, and how often employees just don't fight it. Generally, there are two things I guess you ought to know. A number of very large Minnesota tech companies have a provision in their non-compete agreements that says that if you are offered another job, that would infringe upon your non-compete obligation and you come to us and we refuse to give you a waiver we will pay you your salary for the remainder of the non-compete as long as you can show us that you are actively looking for employment that doesn't violate your non-compete for the remainder of the term there's a reported case back from the early 1980s in which the, there's a 3m uh, it involved 3m and has a provision like that I I don't represent 3M in these cases, and I don't know if they still have that provision, but I do know a number of companies do. Um, secondly, my experience has been that these cases only arise if a person has left company A to go to company B. Company B is almost always asked to determine if there is a non-compete with company A. And if there is, 
they will generally agree to indemnify the employee and defend him if company A comes against him. I see that twice or three times a month. Um, I have only once, only once in the past 15 or 20 years had a case where somebody was sued for violating an non-compete where his current employer refused to indemnify him or pay anything to him or provide a defense. And that didn't involve anybody in Minnesota. Mr. Penelovich, could you, that, that specific language that you referenced that you said is becoming more common, could you send me, um, yeah, I can, send I me can, that language? I can of, pull it out of the 3M and I can find it probably in some, some public piece it, that I can give you. And my, my sense, and you've very more than adequately made your point about, you know, the, the disruptive yeah. uh, 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 result that messing with Minnesota's law could uh, result in. But that which you've just described seems like a very fair balance, and if that's uh, what I what I get, what I was trying to get at, and I think somewhat effectively so, based on the reaction when I introduced this, um, there was no question that it was a shot across the bow of, I mean, just based on the reaction. But the uh, I've heard from countless physicians, which surprised me. I didn't realize that physicians were, were signing non competes, um, who are just absolutely stuck. If you listen to the, and many of whom were very happy that we're holding a hearing today, but sure as heck didn't want to come and testify about it. And a provision like what you've just described, I think, would more than adequately address okay. perhaps the if situation that some have that raised. Ms. Penelovich. One of the tests that the courts apply in determining whether to grant an injunction is a balancing of the harms test. They look at what, what harm is being caused to the employer by a violation of the non-compete right. as opposed to the harm that comes to the employee if he's enjoying. And one of the considerations is the court looks at what is going to happen to the employee if there's an injunction. Is the employee going to be able to support themselves? What's going to happen and so forth? And I think that a number of companies use these provisions because if they can say, look, we have to pay him if you enjoin him, courts, that the balance of harm test goes away. Now, many employers, including employers who I represent, when I advise them that they may want to consider a provision like that in their non compete, will say, no, I, you know, I don't, I don't want to include something like that, but many do. And so you have a mixed bag. But, but I will tell you, other than this one case which involved a Pennsylvania resident and a Georgia employer, I can't think of a case where the employee was left without income from either his old employer or his new employer during the injunction period. Thank you. And Mr. Pan, and then I know Representative Anderson, it just says Anderson. I'm not sure which of the Andersons has a question, but I'm guessing it's Representative Anderson. So, By the way, your son is just a terrific young man. I don't. <laughs> um, so, I can't maybe we 15 minutes ago when we were leaving, I said in 15 minutes. So this is my last uh, <laughs> last deal. Well, I'm thinking of getting patient. some of those Legos and giving them out to members, too. I mean, they <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Um, um, I'll be brief, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, Mr. Pentelovich, can you, can you, do you have any statistics, or and maybe this is better for uh, Mr. Mandel, to talk about, you know, I know Minnesota competes with a lot of biotech firms from other states, Michigan being one of them. I think you mentioned a couple other ones too. I am really concerned about the small firms that I have in my legislative district. Um, very, I mean, these are five five person operations that are in these nondescript buildings in my legislative district. And having one person leave and go, you know, to the place shop right next door could be very um, detrimental to their success as a as a small operation. And, I, and But I'm also concerned about not just how this would impact them here in the state or with other states that have, um, that are big in biotech. I'm also concerned with the foreign companies that we might be competing with. And do you have any experience in, in, in that at all or kind of background that you can give me on that piece or yeah, I mean, I've counseled no, clients regarding non-competes uh, throughout Asia and a little bit in Europe. Now, Europe's different because other than England, they're all civil law countries, and they do have statutes that regulate this, and I'm not real familiar with them. But I can tell you, for example, that Singapore, Hong Kong, New Zealand, and Australia have exactly the same laws as Minnesota, including the Blue Pencil Doctrine. And we are competing with those people, and they, they will provide, you know, German companies, Hong Kong entities, they will provide non-competes, and, you know, they generally will put an American... Uh, you'll have an American headquarters somewhere or American office, and they'll put the law of that state in to govern. But it's, it's, it's I, I can't think 
of a foreign company I've dealt with, and I deal with quite a few on both sides of the issue that doesn't use non-competes. Okay, and the, just the follow-up question, Mr. Chair, and this is maybe for Mr. Mendel. I'm just, I'm concerned about, we earlier had in this committee hearing, we talked about headquarters in the state of Minnesota um, and, and businesses locating here. Is this, would this be a detriment to businesses locating or staying here? And does this, I know I've had uh, bio firms that have tried to come into the Plymouth area and we've lost them to Michigan because we just weren't able to, you know, offer them what they were looking for. And I know I worked with Deed to try and keep this one company there and uh, it was a struggle for them. Does this, does this add to kind of their burden in trying, is the governor going to have to go out to more states to try and lure businesses back to Minnesota? Mr. Chair, Mr. Um, he'll, he'll, he'll get less of a response going out to other states to recruit. Um, you know, there are several significant factors, especially around our industries, and a lot of them are true across the board. Consistency is important. So part of, you know, the consistency in Minnesota's law around these issues is critically important. Um, you know, making changes like this would have a dramatic impact on so you're asking your question, Representative Manson, about sort of the future and the next generation of companies. It is critically important. And so, you know, especially in our space, for example, if you want to start a biotech company today, you want to start a medical technology company today, you know, one of the things that we're all struggling with is the ability to resource those new companies. So, you know, now you've got eight people and $100 million of investment and one real chance to make the right choices to get to where you need to be. So these are as important to small companies in our space as they are to Medtronic, St. Jude, Cargill, Boston Scientific. I mean, this is really about high knowledge, proprietary information. Uh, in terms of, you know, mentioning questions about other countries, I mean, again, it's about certainty in terms of investment, whether that is a large corporation making investment decisions about where to expand in its future, or private investors making investment decisions in new companies. I mean, one of the things here that's great about the United States that we all get to benefit from and that we fight globally every day is IP protection. So, you know, as a nation, we're adamant about working with other nations to enforce IP laws. It is a huge issue in with other countries. I mean, this is akin to that. So, you know, the more certainty and protections, again, not one-sided protections, but fairness, equality, the ability to negotiate the rule of law, this is an important provision. And yes, if if we were to go the route of California or North Dakota, this would certainly impact early stage companies starting here. Uh, and there's no question that, that, that it would impact expansion of our companies here. And one of the reasons we do have so many corporate headquarters is the ability to select the rule of law of Minnesota across the board because as a state, better than most, we have been consistent and fair and straightforward. And so the ability to plan and anticipate how that will be applied, it's really a huge advantage in terms of business for Minnesota. Ms. Thank you, Mr. Mando. Um, thank you, Representative Anderson. Mr. Ben. May I just, um, I would like to echo what Mr. Mandel said and the companies that MALC represents are across diverse industries and I think to echo his point would definitely make decisions based on the environment here. I think that the courts have done a nice job of safeguarding the interest and employers rely on the legal environment when they make decisions. And it's a very significant factor in determining whether you're going to expand or come into a market. Mr. Chairman, I would like to address just a point made earlier that Mr. Pentelovich made about um, some employers having provisions in their non-competes where they will offer offer to pay individuals who are not able to find subsequent employment but for the non-compete provision. And I would say that that is a provision that um, not every employer chooses to put in and not every employer can put in. And I would really caution against having any kind of law which requires employers to have certain provisions in their non-compete and limit and insert itself into the relationship between the employer and the employee. Okay, thank you, Mr. Penn. Are there other questions uh, for either of these two testifiers or anybody else? Anyone else that desires to be heard with respect to this item? All right, thank you all very much. Appreciate everybody coming out this morning. Um, the final topic that we have on the agenda this morning uh, is one that uh, 
I actually, we back years ago, we had a hearing about Stoli, and we had a member of the Commerce Committee who refused to come because it was on April 1st, and he thought it was a joke, and he thought it was a Stoli, meaning the alcohol. Um, but it's actually a stranger originated life insurance and uh, life insurance secondary market. We've got uh, this is sort of an ongoing conversation. I know Representative Dean had a um, had a bill about this. Uh, this is sort of to tee the bill up uh, or tee the issue up a little bit in the interim. Um, possibly for some further discussions before we get into session in 2014. Uh, we've got uh, two testifiers that have signed up, uh, Mr. Leahy and Mr. Gerhardt. Uh, if they could, I see they're already on their way. Gentlemen, thank you for uh, for joining us. Um, see, it really does. I think you're both from uh, outside of Minnesota. It really does get warm here um, <laughs> every once in a while. I'm so from outside Minnesota. I am, I am in Minnesota. <laughs> Well, then you knew. Yeah. <laughs> but try not. We try not to tell too many people that. I was just telling some folks down in Georgia that uh, we have one week out of the year where the ice comes off the lakes, <laughs> and it, uh, it does tend to keep people out. And so, gentlemen, welcome. And uh, I don't know who wants to go first, but kick it off. Uh, first of all, uh, Chair Atkins, I want to thank you for having uh, the hearing today and having as many members here as uh, you have. Uh, I just give a little background about my company and our, our involvement in this industry. <coughs> Uh, Fortress uh, Investment Group is a publicly traded company. We're regulated by the SEC. Uh, Forbes recently nominated us, not nominated us, selected us as one of the 100 best publicly traded companies in the United States, in the world. Uh, that's significant because there are 3,000 publicly traded companies. Uh, Fortress uh, manages about $55 billion roughly on behalf of its investors. Uh, the investors are pension funds, public and private pension funds, universities and foundations. Uh, we manage these investments on their behalf and as a result uh, we manage about 875 uh, million dollars on behalf of the institutions and the people, the firefighters, the teachers, etc. of the people of Minnesota. Uh, Minnesota is a significant state in our investment world and that's one of the reasons why we're here. Uh, in, when the financial crisis hit a number of years ago let me step back, if I may, Chair. Uh, when the financial crisis hit a number of years ago, Fortress was known for investing uh, across the board in many different things so that we would not be hit by a financial crisis. We invest in, uh, we own shopping malls here in Minnesota. But we do not own, I take that back. Our investors own shopping malls in Minnesota. Our investors own hotels in Minnesota. Uh, we're probably the largest uh, lender to hotels in the United States. Uh, we. We, not here in Minnesota, uh, but I have had discussions with a few of you about it. Uh, we're one of the largest lenders to the solar industry as well. Uh, when, when one of the things, when the crisis occurred, uh, three banks in particular, three uh, banks came to us and said, we are having a liquidity crisis. We have all of these assets from office buildings in Kansas City to hotels in Miami Beach. We need to sell things in order to stay afloat. Uh, in many cases, they did not want to take TARP money. And that's why they came to us, because they knew that if we shook hands with them and we, had a, we would have a deal and we would uh, pay them on time and we would go about managing the asset on behalf of our investors. These three banks came to us and one of the things that was intriguing to us was uh, life settlement policies. And as I've, I've had the opportunity, I think, to speak to all of you uh, over the last 16 months, uh, the life insurance policies, your whole or universal life insurance policy could be sold like any other asset. Uh, it's been considered that way for 100 years. The United States <coughs> Supreme Court put that into place. Uh, we purchased these policies, and I'll go give you a little background on how we purchased them. Uh, when you purchase these policies, you get the uh, file that the insurance carrier uh, used to uh, put the policy in place to underwrite the policy, and any other subsequent information is contained in that file. Uh, Fortress read through the file. We hired multiple law firms, two law firms, in fact, uh, two accounting firms and an actuarial firm to do the due diligence with us. Uh, we also went beyond that. We also went and did public record searches. Does the person live at the address they say they live at? Does the person have the job that they say they had? And we continued to uh, we diligence the portfolio. Each day our portfolio was diligenced. Uh, and it was diligenced extremely well uh, on the outset. And I, I thank you, Chair, for having us uh, come and testify today because I think it's an important thing. Recently, the front page of the Life Settlement Reporter, I'm sure all of you receive it uh, every day. <laughs> uh, one of the things, and people may look at me a bit incredulously, but this is really also a consumer issue uh, because what has happened in the market, 
there's uncertainty in the market. Across many of the states, there's an incredible amount of uncertainty. And investors are not investing in this uh, product line anymore. And the reason that why they're not investing is because courts are coming up with varying decisions all across the country that are in direct <coughs> conflict. And I'm not going to talk about the legal aspects of it because I'm no longer a lawyer. <laughs> uh, but courts have looked at this and in different ways. And in the end, usually the investor community uh, wins out on them. Uh, but there is uncertainty. And I thank the chair for ha having us at, here today. And I also thank you for scheduling something in September and October. As I've expressed many times in many states, uh, we're willing to work with people. We're infinitely reasonable people. And I, when I say we, I think that's where Kurt comes in. This is an industry. Uh, it's just not one company. And it's just lots of people. And I, if I may, to refresh your recollection, the largest investor in this product is uh, AIG, the insurance company. Uh, McKinsey, the consulting firm, is one of the largest investors in this product. So, and certainly the California, and I always forget what CalPERS stands for, but CalPERS is one of the largest investors in this uh, space as well. And again, I thank you for scheduling things, and I'm always willing to talk. Thank you, thank you Mr. Lee. Uh, good, good morning, and thank you, Mr. Chairman uh, and fellow committee members. It's always great to be speaking last and uh, right, right in front of the uh, the pizza. I guess that's uh, here. Do, do we get to participate? Doesn't actually arrive well? till noon, so you got all right. Well, you got twenty one minutes. Don't uh... <laughs> great. Um, <laughs> this is uh, a, a very Im important topic, um, not necessarily for investors for the insurance companies, although I know they're the ones that are generally here, but very important topic for for Minnesota seniors. And hopefully I can uh, draw a little bit of a different perspective um, than, than what you, you hear from those who are, are well healed and, and actually uh, have the, uh, the opportunity to, to meet with, with folks on a regular basis. Uh, I'm Kurt Gerhardt. I'm the CEO of 21st Services. We're a Minneapolis-based company. And since 1998, our company has provided underwriting and policy services for the life settlement industry, um, independent services. We, um, you know, th there, there's two points that I'd like to make today, and one, one is that life settlements are becoming an increasingly important tool for our aging seniors, seniors here in Minnesota as, as well as across the country. And two, the, the group that's going to benefit most from there being clarity in the legislation uh, about what will happen uh, when, a, when a policy matures, will an insurance company be required to pay or return premiums, the group that's going to benefit the most is going to be the seniors. And Mr. Gerhardt, if I can interrupt, this, you've got a relatively sophisticated group around this table, but you may want to um, explain what a, what a life settlement is before you sure. get too far along. Sure. Uh, a life settlement uh, is for uh, a senior of, um, who has a life insurance policy that they no longer want, need, can afford the premiums, they've outlived the need for coverage. Uh, there's now a market um, for those seniors to be able to, to sell their policy to investors. Um, Fortress owns a, a, a portfolio, AIG is, is a, um, has purchased uh, purchased a, a, a significant uh, portion of policies over the year. Actually, I think they, they are, over the years, I think they are the biggest investor in, in life settlements. But it, it gives the uh, the consumer an opportunity to sell their policy, whereas before the life settlement industry existed, they could only surrender it to the insurance carrier for the cash surrender value. And so, generally, the people who are selling their policies are getting five, six, seven times uh, what the insurance carrier is offering them in return for surrendering the policy. <coughs> So, I mean, over you know, there, there's a few interesting facts that, that uh, you know, when, when I look at our business and when we talk about it, what we're doing at, at 21st Services and how we're benefiting society, I, I look back at a few facts, you know, regularly. One, over 50 percent of the people on Earth who have reached the age 65 are living today. So, um, another one, according to the U.S. Census, during the 20th century, the persons under the age 65 has tripled. But those 65 and older has gone up by a, a factor of 11. In Minnesota, uh, we've talked a lot, a lot of great things about Minnesota here today, business and, and, and other things, uh, clarity of laws. Uh, in Minnesota, we have the second highest life expectancy in the United States, um, with people uh, ex, um, over 81 years old, which is nearly 10 percent longer than the state with the, the lowest life expectancy. But as seniors are living beyond what even they expected to live, and as you know, we, we know the issues with uh, Social Security, Medicare, 
public pension funds, people are living a lot longer than expected. And so that does have um, a, a lot of consequences. And one thing seniors have done is they've outlived their need for insurance policies in many cases. And so, or those insurance policies have become too expensive for them to maintain because insurance premiums do generally increase every year that, uh, um, uh, that you advance in age. And so the seniors have really gone to this market and taken advantage of this market that they can actually sell this policy and fund their retirement, fund, um, you know, pay down the mortgages, fund um, whatever they need to fund, health care, uh, a variety of things. And so it's really this, this market has given these seniors something that 10, 15 years ago none of them knew they actually had, which was a, a real value in their life insurance policy aside from what the insurance carrier could offer them. You know, at 21st Services, our employees, we, we talk about it, I don't want to say every day because that's not true, but we probably every week we do talk about as a company what we are providing is, an, is something for seniors. We're providing services that are helping seniors get money that they never expected that they could, could get, and that's uh, by, by selling their policies in the market. And so it really has helped uh, help the seniors. I guess the you know why we're here today, and and, uh, and I n and understand there's been some discussions on this in, in the last legislative session, and so maybe we're a little little late to the to the to the game here to give our input, but we're we're happy to be doing it. What can the legislator do to make sure that the seniors continue to have access to this market and are continuing are are able to continue to get uh, get the value in their policies? Most life settlement investors historically did not think that carriers could contest a policy after two years, or if they did contest a policy, at a minimum, they'd have to return the premiums. There was a lot of common law that was out there that would suggest that. So investors paid expecting that if a policy ever was contested, that they would at least get the premiums back. And in reality, investors didn't think carriers could contest policies after two years. And I'll, and I'll just give a, a real short uh, you know, quote from a, um, a, a recent lawsuit. Why is it, why are there, there are contestability laws out there that say carriers cannot contest a policy after two years? And, and why are those there? Uh, the laws, um, the, the public policy behind contestability has always been clear. Requiring companies to pay after two years encourages insurance companies to investigate so as to avoid fraudulent or wagering contracts entering the market from the beginning. Failing to require carriers to pay the, after the contestability period provides them no incentive to investigate. Well, unfortunately, um, for the life settlement market, carriers have made it a challenge or made it a practice uh, to start challenging policies that seniors sold in life settlement transactions. So the investors, when the well, when the insureds uh, die and, and the investors are there to collect the benefits. Um, the, the insurance companies are there also and starting to file challenges and saying we're not going to pay the premiums on these or we're not going to uh, pay the death benefit on these policies. Uh, you know, this uncertainty has led, and, and it, it's, uh, this is a reality, has led investors to start paying less for policies. When they have to take a risk that the insurance company may not pay on this policy, they're not going to pay the senior as much. Uh, for, for the policies, and that, as I said, I know that the, the parties that are typically here advancing this, uh, the legislative front, are, are well-heeled investors or insurance companies. But the truth is, going forward, investors can price in risk. That's what they do. Uh, investors can tell that there's a difference in the price that they would pay for bonds issued by the uh, city of Minneapolis versus bonds issued by the city of Detroit. Um, Investors can look at this and say, well, the, the law is unclear now. We always thought that we would be able to get the death benefit after two years, but now there's uncertainty here and we may not be able to get it. Investors can price that risk in. And who really gets hurt when they price that risk in is the, is, is the senior who's selling their policy because all of a sudden investors aren't willing to pay as much for policies as they used to, as they used to do. And so yeah, I think the legislator legislature here does have a real opportunity to clarify, you know, I think what everyone has expected and what the long public policy has been is that carriers have two years to do their investigation and decide whether or not they need to, they're going to contest an insurance policy. And after that two year period, if it's very clear that the carriers cannot contest that policy or at a minimum they would have to return the premiums if they did, that will help uh, Minnesota seniors get the full value for their insurance policies. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gerhardt. Um, before we take questions, is there anyone else that desires to be heard with respect to this? 
Um, I do want to make one thing clear, and I wanted to make sure that you guys were clear. We're not. I don't think there's anybody on the committee that supports stranger-originated life insurance, where somebody buys on somebody that they're unrelated to, and they are just making a bet that they're going to be able to recover the life insurance proceeds. Um, but the the one where you lose people oftentimes is on that contestability issue. And I I look to you, Mr. Gerhardt, the uh, when you um, what. Could you give an example of, and if you want to use uh, use me, you could. But uh, when I, if I buy a life insurance policy today, uh, whatever the date is today, what is it, August twenty eighth or twenty ninth, um, two thousand thirteen, uh, and if uh, that policy gets, what I'm asking you to do is use a use a real person example, uh, because you really do tend to. I don't know if you lost anybody else, but I think you lose a lot of people when you. And, and it goes two years out and gets sold. Could you give an example like that of how long that uh, that contestability would uh, would last, and when the insurance company would have a right or not have a right to to contest it or investigate it? Sure, Chairman. Um, I'll, I'll use myself as an example. That's if probably I, better than you yeah. and me because it would potentially involve my death, and I'd rather not. <laughs> I've already got insurance yeah. on you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if I took out an insurance policy today and, uh, you know, for you know, the primary purpose of me taking it out would be income protection. I've got three young children, so the, you know, if I'm no longer able to, uh, to earn money, I'm going to, th that money will be there for, for my, for my uh, children if I die. The carriers, the insurance industry, or uh, Minnesota has laws and most states have laws that say after two, the carrier can only contest a policy for two years. So if I die at any time, if I committed fraud on my insurance application, I said I never smoked cigarettes and I actually was a smoker, or I said, um, yeah, or I didn't write down that I um, you know, do jump out of airplanes every now and then, those types of things. If, if I excluded that information from the application, the carrier has two years to do their investigation and decide whether or not they're going to contest the policy or not. And if they find that there's been fraud or that I haven't been truthful in the application, they can contest that policy for two years. After that two-year period, and this is where the courts of in this public policy has long been held, it's the duty of the carriers to investigate at that point in time um, to do it. There needs to be certainty that for my family that if I continue to pay insurance premiums over the years, 10, 15 years, if I do you know, have an unfortunate demise, an early demise, that that money will be there and that the carriers aren't going to show up 10 years later, 15 years later and start contesting every policy and saying, well, if we go back five years ago when uh, Kirk took out this policy, we can see that he, he misstated this so we're not going to pay you know, what his family's been expecting to receive. Um, on your point with, um, in, uh, and I don't think Fortress or anyone in the life settlement industry has ever supported people taking out policy, you know, going to insured and say, take out this policy today and sell it you know, and sign over the benefits to me tomorrow. The life settlement industry, and actually there are laws here, and very clear laws here in Minnesota as well as most other states that regulate, people can't sell a policy until they've owned it for at least two years. Um, so that happens to coincide with the contestability period, which is partly why I think it was put in there in the original. So if, if a person takes out a policy, if I take out a policy and I want to sell it, I can't sell it for two years. And that was partly to protect the investors as well, that you know they're not going to buy an asset that could be contested by a carrier. Are there other, thank you, by the way. Are there other questions for, uh, for either of our testifiers? Um, I, and so, Representative Hoppy, to your point, that means you've got to keep paying those premiums on the policy you have on me for two years. What? Uh, yeah, I know. Bummer. Huh? But uh, uh, thank you. <laughs> we need to talk. <laughs> oh, those small farmer guys. Um, the, on behalf of uh, the Commerce Committee, on behalf of the Chair, thank you to the members. Thank you to everybody that came and testified on the various topics. Uh, this is one I think we're going to continue some discussions in the interim, so it was a nice uh, opportunity to tee it up a little bit, uh, and we'll look forward to hearing from both sides with respect to it as uh, the interim moves along. Um, for members, I think the note went around. It's 500 north if you have an opportunity. I got uh, more pizza than you all could probably eat, um, but appreciate you, <laughs> appreciate you coming in today. And with that, folks, we stand adjourned.